All right, we're live. Okay. Welcome everyone to the new normal virtual city council meeting. Today is Tuesday, July 28, 2020, and it's approximately 6 p.m. I'd like to acknowledge that both the press and the public were duly notified of this meeting in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act. As everyone knows by now, all of our city meetings are being held virtually due to the COVID-19 and can be seen, seen live on YouTube or if you want to, go back and watch previous meetings. Please follow our latest news on our newly created website, www.iop.net, and follow us on both Twitter and Facebook. Public comments can be submitted by following the agenda instructions on the website. We will read the first 30 minutes worth of comments as they come in with a three minute time limit for each. Please feel free to join me or not while I say a short prayer to be followed by saying the Pledge of Allegiance and then our roll call. <coughs> if not, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this life that we all share on this earth. During this unprecedented pandemic, help everyone realize that we all have to make sacrifices. There are third world countries that have death in the streets. Yet here in America, we have first world issues like beach access or lower levels of business. I thank you, Lord, for my living here in the greatest country with the best of medical professionals. I ask everyone to step back and look at the conditions worldwide. Please help and guide us tonight as we tackle some of these challenges in making the right decisions that will take us forward for future generations. Please, Lord, look over our residents, our city family, our public safety personnel, our military, especially during this latest challenge, the COVID-19. Help everyone remember we are in this together. And to overcome this virus, we must all practice safe social distancing and wear masks in crowded areas. Lord, as we are now in the 2020 hurricane season, Please look over and protect all coastal communities. I rest in peace knowing that you are always looking over me. Amen. Amen. Rhonda, flag, please. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, United of, America States of America and to the Republic, Republic which is which stands stands one nation, nation under God, under God and and with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. <laughs> Roll call. Councilmember Bell. Councilmember Bell. Councilmember Friedman. I'm sorry, who? You. No. <laughs> hey, present. <laughs> Very good. Councilmember Pounds. Here. Councilmember Ward. Here. Councilmember Popson? Here. Councilmember Smith? Here. Councilmember Buchanan? Here. Councilmember Moy? Here. There he is. Uh, and Mayor Carroll? Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Okay. Reading of the journals of the previous meetings. We have four of them regular meeting on June 23rd, 2020. Emergency meeting on June the 26th, 2020. Special meeting on July 9th, 2020. And an emergency meeting on July 15th, 2020. Do I hear a motion to approve? I make the motion, Mayor. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Does everybody want to hear a reading or just pass by as read? I, I would like to ask for a change to the, um, in addition to the July 15th emergency meeting um, that I've already run by Nicole, but just that I uh, wanted it clearly stated on the record that I voiced objections to the parking restrictions, but uh, would cast a yes vote for the overall ordinance that, to show my support of restrictions related to bars and nightclubs. Okay, fine. Anything else, Susan? Anybody else? That's Okay. All those in favor, roll call, please. Uh, Councilmember Streetman? Aye. 
Councilmember Bell. Aye. Councilmember Pounds. Aye. Councilmember Ward. Aye. Councilmember Popson. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Uh, Councilmember Moy. Aye. Councilmember Buchanan. Aye. Mayor Carroll. Aye. All in favor? Thank you very much. Okay, citizens' comments. Nicole, <laughs> we had 139. We're only going to read up to 30 minutes worth. None of them are going to exceed three minutes at the most. Yes, so, sir. If you would, please, the first 30 minutes worth. Very good. Somebody would come keep track of time to help her. Our first comment is from Cheryl Provost of Isle of Palms. Although I know how it feels to live off island and fight for parking, as a resident, it has been so nice not to have cars parked all over Palm. You feel like you can safely cross the street, not have the backup and speeding cars a day, a day trippers leave. I hope you will consider only allowing parking on the beach side of Palm. Nadine Deef, also of Isle of Palms, as much as your position is difficult, it is better to exert less power on the people of Isle of Palms and even the entire state and make little changes than what is going on now with the constant changes and power grabs. Be effective leaders and return things to normal before you all went rogue. We do not need anything, any bans on anything from chairs to coolers to parking. Please stop acting like you are obligated to solve world COVID issues. Please take a break. Our island was fine last summer. Stop calling emergency meetings and making decisions that are worse for everyone else. Return to summer 2019 rules and regulations with extra security for beach patrol on weekends. If that's the real reason y'all are still trying to figure out how to improve and so improve social distancing, go home. There's no emergency that you can fix unless you have a cure for COVID. Dale Donnelly of Mount Pleasant, please do not eliminate free parking for us in Mount Pleasant. Katie Hoy of Somerville, this is ridiculous. You want to cut off public access for a public beach. We travel to the beach three times a week during the summer and cannot get on the beach lately because you have pumped all of the people together in one spot instead of allowing to space out like it was by allowing parking access. You sure do want our tax money to refurbish the beach after it is destroyed by all the hurricanes and you want us to support your local businesses, but we're not allowed to park and access the beach. Yet somehow you'll allow people from out of state to visit, how ironic. You are turning IP, IOP into New England beaches where it isn't accessible to the people who live here. And yes, I live here even if it's 40 minutes away. Mindy Goldman of Isle of Palms. I am totally against any parking ban on Palm Boulevard and in the neighborhood on the southern end of IOP. Living on IOP means accepting that you share the public beaches with the public. It also means accepting the relative inconvenience of heavier traffic three months of the year so that others may share and enjoying the beauty of the island. Using the excuse that a parking ban will curb COVID-19 is a joke and an insult to the intelligence of all citizens. Sophia Nelson of Daniel Island, the recent modifications to the parking of Isle of Palms Beach are safe and unfair, unsafe and unfair. Please consider reversing the parking decisions. Bottlenecks of people that won't be able to socially distance are created by restricting parking access. If parking is ample and spread over more space, and more beach access points will be utilized and this will prevent clusters of people that could spread COVID to one another. Enjoying the beach is perfectly safe as long as people are social distan socially distancing from others, not in the same household. And restricting access to the beach is only driving those beachgoers in closer proximity to one another. This is an unfair policy that restricts beach access to other citizens in Charleston. I am an RN that has cared for local COVID patients since the spring and this year has been incredibly stressful. I used to enjoy walking along the beach and swimming far away from others, and it was a tremendous relief of stress, but now I feel it is unsafe for me to visit the beach anymore due to the parking changes. You are robbing people of the simple joy of visiting the beach. These changes feel like a slap in the face after working so hard to care for our community. Kim McCracken, also of Daniel Island, give the beaches back to the people. Do not charge for parking and do not infringe on access by prohibiting parking. The IOP beaches are maintained with taxpayer dollars and should be accessible by all and not by having to pay parking. There are many previous court cases that were not in the favor of town councils or residents trying to block access to public beaches. Many of your own residents are against parking restrictions. Um, Arita Ziegler of Mount Pleasant, 
I would like parking for non-residents to be fully reinstated. Our county taxes go to Isle of Palms and Sullivan's Island. Safe public parking should be provided to access all areas of the public beach. The parking area for the county park is now congested and provides a greater chance to spread COVID-19. Please rethink your decrease in street parking by reopening all parking to public. Jenny Smith of Mount Pleasant, please issue a parking pass to enjoy the beach. I'm 73 years old. And in the many years I've lived in Mount Pleasant, I've always been respectful and followed rules. When we lived on Sullivan's Island, I would let folks park in our driveway, never unorderly, miss not going to the beach with my daughter for quality time. Francis Williams, Mount Pleasant. I am not sure why all parking restrictions got voted in, but it sure has nothing to do with the COVID virus. You're limiting parking, so there are less people at our six mile beach. With only the few parking areas that are allowed, everyone congregates in one area of the beach. Some people are inconvenienced and, takes, and take a walk down to a more open space, but elderly, handicapped, and families with small children carrying coolers and chairs won't take the walk. This in fact leaves them no choice but to sit by the pier along with so many others, no social distancing at all. How is that helping anyone with not catching the virus? The beach should be an inviting place for everyone to share. We are all so fortunate to have it now more than ever. It's a place people come and forget their worries even just for a short while. If every, it's everyone's happy place, please do the right thing and reconsider this awful parking ban. Please, please bring our Southern hospitality back to all of us. Marianne Andrews, Mount Pleasant, give us back access to our beach. The county, quote, my taxes, provides funds for the island. Stop trying to keep this access to yourself and only for profit by paid parking and private vacation rentals. How do you expect us to support your local businesses when you will not allow us access to the beach throughout the island in a way that would allow for maintaining social distancing? Instead, you have attempted to corral everyone to Front Beach to further the spread of COVID-19. This policy makes no sense and can only be motivated by selfishness to keep the island for residents only and by greed, since you are still allowing vacationers from all over to rent your private beach houses. Dr. Paul Kometz, Mount Pleasant. Members of this council own and operate real estate businesses on the Isle of Palms. These members are attempting to manipulate beach access laws such that they directly benefit their business interest. This is a clear conflict of interest. The members that own real estate businesses should resign the IOP City Council. When the COVID pandemic is resolved, beach access should remain free and open with parking as historically defined. Failure to do so will likely result in a legal challenge. Kelly Van Villet, Mount Pleasant. I will make this short. I think we can all agree that living on the coast of South Carolina is a blessing. I have lived in Mount Pleasant since 1998 and have enjoyed countless days on the beach, whether it be taking the dogs for a walk in the morning, enjoying the beach and sand during the day, or just hanging out in the evening. You, the council members, have taken this away without true and valid reasoning. Your reasoning of the virus was found untrue even during the, your initial meeting. How can you possibly justify crowding people on one section of IOP is better than spreading people out on the beach? Who makes you the almighty? who can take away so many residents' rights to parking throughout IRP. You claim it's only 30 days. Well, 30 days means a lot when you do it in the heat of the summer, during some folks' last days before heading to college. And in our case, when my son, who will be deploying to the Middle East with the 75th Regiment and has one week to spend with us, thanks. Thanks for choosing to take away this precious time because of the hidden agendas to selfishly make a private island for yourselves. This is a sad time to live in the low country and I hope you know how much each of you have contributed to so much sadness and discontent for no valid reasons. <clears throat> you are supposed to be listening to and representing your community. Instead, this is what you will be remembered for. Ellen Reed, Mount Pleasant. I have been going surfing very early at IOP 31st to 35th prior to going to work to manage stress for years. No more parking, can't surf. I was told I have to park at the meters and walk. Is there any parking exception for surfers? Megan Thornton, Mount Pleasant. I ask the members to please reconsider charging for parking at the beach. I work at a local school and going to the beach is one of the only things that my students that do not have a lot of money can do for free here, especially during COVID. Even a couple dollars is enough to have parents tell their children they cannot go. It breaks my heart that a community that is usually welcoming and all inclusive is making the community so separated and, unha and unhappy. Please reconsider. Cindy Dawson. Daniel Island, I grew up in Mount Pleasant and my family enjoyed visiting IOP. 
I took my children to visit as they grew up. I am now 65 years old and am restricted from visiting. I was a polite visitor who even picked up other folks' trash if I saw it. I knew visiting the island was a privilege and was so thankful to have this beautiful resource. Now I cannot find a parking space and I'm not allowed to visit. Please do not take your beautiful island away from me by reducing parking and access. Please consider those of us who grew up here and have always been respectful. David Ship, Mount Pleasant. Council members, I love going to the beach as I am sure you all enjoy going as well. My favorite place is to go to go is 40th to get away from the crowds, connecting with nature, admiring the beauty, swimming, walking, and relaxing are my favorite things to do there. I would like you to consider how eliminating parking on Palm would make it impossible for Mount Pleasant residents like me to continue to safely access the beach. Denise Sexton, Aondal, I spent my childhood on Sullivan's Island, brought my children to the beach, and now my grandchildren. It is one of the most beautiful pleasures of living in the low country to be able to enjoy the beach. I am sad to see the further restrictions of public parking that has taken place. I understand that we are under strange times and the growth in people moving to the low country has gotten out of control. To only allow parking in a condensed area does not create social distancing. The summer is a time when we can enjoy exercising on the beach and teaching our grands how to surf, walk our dogs, and enjoy the therapeutic relaxation that the ocean offers. It is shameful that this difficult financial time with the virus to put another strain on people families to pay for parking to come do the one thing that would make them feel less stressed. I have seen numerous stories of the hardship people would incur by trying to access the beach with the current restrictions. I would hope the mayor and council would reconsider their restrictions on public parking and take into consideration that family that has an autistic child who seeks therapy in coming to the beach or the frontline essential nurse who wants to take a walk on the beach to relieve the tremendous stress that they incur daily and just the locals who do love their childhood beach, <clears throat> excuse me, and leave it a better place than when they arrive by removing all the trash and debris left by short-term renters. The out-of-town renters truly do not have an invested interest in the beach. I personally have been involved in many beach sweeps, cleanups with a surf group. If the mayor and council would consider a less restrictive parking resolution and be open to suggestions from the locals who live here year round. Sorry. Mm. I am sure they could come up with a better solution. Going, growing up on Sullivan's Island during my childhood, there was no IOP connector bridge and it seemed like both islands worked together to allow for the public to enjoy the ocean because it's not a gated beach, it is public and should be allowed to be shared by the public and locals. Emily Topaldo, Mount Pleasant. The Beachfront Management Act of 1988 established well-defined lead role in the, of the state in developing comprehensive statewide beach management program. Furthermore, the act includes this key legislative finding Quote, the importance of the beach and dune system in protecting life and property from storms, providing sig significant economic revenue through tourism, providing habitat for important plants and animals, and providing a healthy environment for recreation and improved quality of life for all citizens. And she provides a lengthy link to that on uh, DHEC's website. As a resident of Mount Pleasant and therefore resident and taxpayer of Charleston County and the state of South Carolina, I urge you to restore parking access that enables a healthy environment for recreation and improved quality of life for citizens as well as guests. It sickens me to think that some might dare to try to use the coronavirus as a means to selfishly limit access to public beaches when it is a known fact that based on official comments from the Isle of Palms chief of police that social distancing has not been an issue on the beach. People within our community are stressed to their limits, parents are overworked with no time off and no escape, Healthcare workers and first responders are putting themselves in disproportionate danger on a daily basis. People are waiting for normalcy to return without any indication when that might come. The beach offers sanctuary for so many and the inability to easily access and easily park and access the beach safely without overcrowding and knowing that their very own tax dollars have gone to maintaining the beach equates to additional anger. Please consider your actions carefully. The IOP beach is paid for and cared for by so many beyond the immediate IOP residents and property owners. Cindy Dunelks of Mount Pleasant, your neighbors in Mount Pleasant respectfully ask you to reconsider your parking ban implemented under the guise of limiting COVID spread. Your current restrictions have quite the opposite effect by forcing the visitors to park in the limited amounts of paid parking, whether that be city or county park lots. You have instead exacerbated the problem. You have made it virtually impossible for families with small children to safely enjoy a day at the beach since we cannot spread out far from where we are able to park since we are also mm -hmm. toting along kids and beach necessities that family needs with small kids. You have taken the joy of summer away from my little ones all while allowing out-of-state travelers access to your beaches. 
This is not only a slap in the face of your neighboring communities for limiting our beach access, but it is also allowing those out of state visitors to potentially keep contributing to the rising COVID cases and spreading it when they come over the bridge to Mount Pleasant to dine or take partake in other recreational activities. I hope you will reconsider. Claudia Colvin, Mount Pleasant. Respectfully, I have to say that this council is adding to the hatred and division that is happening in this country. At a time when we should be supporting one another, we are pulling each other down, pitting neighbor against neighbor. I so appreciate all of the IOP residents who do not support what you are trying trying to do to limit beach access to everyone who so desperately needs a respite from these unbelievable times we are living. If you dig deep into your souls, you know this is not about COVID. The numbers in Charleston County have been dropping and I believe they will continue to drop as summer tourists return to their own states. I have never seen so many out of state license plates as I have this summer. We have a couple of real, real retail stores in Mount Pleasant and every other customer who comes in is from out of town. This beach community we live in is no different than any other beach community in the world. Summer months are unbearably busy, but then most people go away and it becomes peaceful again. I grew up in beach communities, even in Italy. And when you move to one, you just accept the summer can be a little challenging, but you learn to adjust and plan accordingly. You should be honored that so many people want to enjoy your beach community, but you cannot make it difficult or impossible for the residents of Charleston County to enjoy what gives us peace of mind in this not so peaceful time. If you Google ocean and natural resources, the definition is, quote, one of Earth's most valuable natural resources, close quote, is, is, does not say, does not say IOP's natural resource. Justine Pottinger, North Charleston, please open up, back up street parking. I come to the Isle of Palms two to three times a week. And because there's no street parking for people to spread out on the island, the county park area has become so congested, it's impossible to social distance. Also, the parking is mislabeled as $2 an hour when in reality you are charging $2.50 an hour. Janice Gorg Gorgialis, Mount Pleasant. I am appalled and infuriated that IOP has decided to eliminate most parking for non-residents. What is worse is to use the guide of COVID, which clearly is absurd since you've now forced people into a small area where they are on top of each other. I solely moved here from New Jersey to be close to the beach as I love the ocean. I also suffer from lupus, and yet I refuse to allow this council to take the beach away from me. Yesterday, I parked in the municipal lot and had to drag my chairs and bag while my body was in pain. As I entered the beach area, I was appalled at the amount of people on top of each other. This is so dangerous and you should be responsible for, you all should be responsible for spreading COVID to people when they could be spread out along six miles of beach. I had been going to the beach in IOP for weeks before your restrictions were put into place and there was plenty of social distancing if you didn't go to the municipal beach area. We pay our taxes and support the IOP businesses. How dare you take this away from all of us? I will fight to retain a lawyer with the rest of us unhappy and angry local residents to help change this absurd and clearly selfish decision. Susan Heffron, Mount Pleasant, please make beach access a priority to all Charleston County taxpayers. Brian Faust, Mount Pleasant, complete overreach has been going on for too long. Now you have finally gone too far and stepped in your own mess. Best of luck trying to save face. You all, with the exception of two, have lost your connection to the very people you serve. Best of luck, you are going to need it. All of you can get spoiled rotten with power. Nikki Roberts, North Charleston, one of my twins' favorite things to do is to have a day at the beach. They are three and full of life. Going to the beach is one cheap way that I can entertain my kids during this terrible pandemic and also a reason I chose to raise my family in Charleston County. They haven't been able to play with their friends for months and now one of the places they love is also taken away. City Council knows this is wrong and the fact that so many IOP residents are opposed to this should speak volumes. Open parking back up and listen to what people want. This isn't about COVID, this is about greed, plain and simple. Everyone that voted in favor of this should be ashamed of themselves. Judy Hammett, Mount Pleasant. I am a lifetime resident of Charleston and I've been going to IOP my entire life. This beach is a state treasure that we cannot lose. In 2017, the IOP wrote a commitment to maintain the public beaches. Please do not take out, take out public, our public beach away. The latest change to the parking has demonstrated that some council members do not want a public beach. Please do not let them ruin our beaches. Keep parking free and plentiful. Catherine Gaffos, Mount Pleasant. Please open up the parking again so that families with children can enjoy our beaches again. It is one of the safest and healthiest activities we can enjoy while navigating this pandemic. It belongs to all of us and you have a moral and legal obligation to ensure we have adequate access. 
issue a social distancing mandate and give tickets to those not adhering. We all want what is best for both islands as well as Mount Pleasant and all that visit. I think there are many who would help disperse crowds that jeopardize things for the rest of us. Thank you for whatever help you can provide. Kelly Miller, Mount Pleasant, parking restrictions should be lifted immediately. Having these in place makes it more congested in other areas instead of people being able to spread out. The beach is one of the few places people are able to go and enjoy some beauty, peace, and relaxation and have plenty of room to spread out. This is something everyone should be able to enjoy. I'm a Mount Pleasant native and I think this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Please lift these restrictions. Brian Olofsson, Mount Pleasant. As a neighbor and taxpayer in Mount Pleasant, I am very concerned with how all the IOP local neighbors are being treated, allowing short-term rentals to go on without restriction where many of these visitors are, COVID, are from COVID hotspots and restricting parking for local beachgoers appears counter to the reason you gave for this decision. While I have been to the beach and many others, including the IOP police, social distancing has not been a problem. Council's comments on record for the desire to make some of these parking restrictions permanent and a council member declaring his desire to keep any undesirable day trippers away further adds destruct, distrust in council's decisions regarding parking within the city with the Charleston community. If people do not obey social distancing, driving, parking, or any other laws or ordinances, they should be ticketed, but restricting access is not the answer. I am sure that you are all aware of the public perception of the surrounding communities and a large number of IOP residents. I ask that the IOP Town Council please reconsider these restrictions, both temporary and the permanent restrictions that have been discussed, and welcome your neighbors. Kyle Jackson, Mount Pleasant, please remove current parking restrictions. I am in favor of rules and enforcement. I respect that but please do not take away parking. I know there are lots of arguments from both sides, but you eventually need to check your moral compass. What's happening is wrong. Rebecca Lyon, Mount Pleasant. I think all parking, including Palm Boulevard, should be available for non-residents. I live in Mount Pleasant, pay taxes, and do not believe the recent lack of parking and funneling everyone to one parking area is beneficial to the reduction of the COVID spread. We have the right to park for free, spread out, and enjoy the beaches. Amy Etheridge, Mount Pleasant. I respectfully request that these comments be considered in response to the recent restrictions enacted by the Isle of Palms Town Council. The recent parking restrictions have unfairly limited access to our public beaches and these unfounded and misguided actions need to be re reversed. On Saturday, I headed out to enjoy a nice day of surfing and relaxing on the beach at Isle of Palms. I was shocked, dismayed and saddened to discover that parking had not had not been merely reduced, but in fact eliminated. There was not one single non-resident parking spot to be found from Palm Boulevard north to Wild Dunes, not one. Let that sink in for a moment. The Isle of Palms is a public beach with public access paths that the public cannot actually use to get to the beach. It became quite evident that this was not about limiting the number of people to reduce the spread of the disease. This was a calculated plan to restrict the access of non-residents to our public beaches. This is simply wrong and must be changed. The Isle of Palms is a public beach and belongs to all citizens of South Carolina. The residents of the Isle of Palms are not owners, but simply the stewards of our beautiful beaches who have been entrusted to preserve and protect them for all. Our beaches are God-given resources created for the enjoyment of everyone and should never be owned or restricted to the enjoyment of an elite few who are blessed to call them home. I hope that instead of attempting to limit the access of others, that you will choose instead to use your position of power to be good stewards of these resources and manage public access in a way that all deserve. Denise Kish, Mount Pleasant, please reconsider your parking limits. It's unfair to all of us paying taxes to you and you're keeping us from the enjoying a free beach access. Your renters are the reason we are in this situation. You allowed them to come in. Now we are all suffering from your mistake. I missed my Sunday afternoon, then my stop at your restaurants or Sullivan Seafood. Please understand what you did and remove the parking restrictions. Andrea McCollum, Mount Pleasant. I live in Mount Pleasant and usually go to the beach once a week on a weekday. This year I've been about four times since all the COVID business is going on. I went to station six on July 16th. I felt lucky to find parking easy enough. Beach had very few people, easily a 12 foot radius around us at all times. Last week on a Tuesday at four and absolutely no parking between third and ninth. It was just aggravating and heartbreaking at the same time. Why can't I go to the beach on a weekday at an off time like four o'clock? There are no problems with crowds down at that end. I'm quite certain your parking rules are forcing everyone to be jammed in the same area. It truly makes no sense. Please reconsider your parking rules. Tanya, Tanya Barons, Mount Pleasant. 
We are small business owners in Mount Pleasant and have served IOP for almost 20 years now. It is so frustrating that we are no longer able to park um, at 7 to 9 a.m. around 30th to catch some waves before going to work all day. A resident has been kind enough to let us park at her house and we can walk with surfboards five blocks to surf, but it is such an inconvenience and seems so hostile to the surf community. So welcoming and so unfriendly to locals. We personally know several people who have become sick with COVID from hanging out at the dinghy bar, but bars are open and surf is off limits where social distance is working best. We hope you will reconsider letting locals park again to surf IOP. Jane uh, Schuler, Mount Pleasant. This is probably gonna be the last one. Long. Um, as an IOP and Charleston County resident, it is unfortunate that access to a public beach has basically been denied. Owning property in Wild Dunes gives me access. However, Charleston County citizens pay more taxes for roads and facilities. South Carolina citizens pay taxes for beach renourishment through FEMA. Furthermore, if the goal was social distancing, that has been exacerbated as now crowds at the pay to park areas are packed in and the beach areas reflect this. IOP petitioned DHEC and the state to take over the beach management plan for the island and was granted this privilege. Perhaps we the public should petition DHEC and the state as to the abuse of this quote achievement. See section 1.3 billeted lines six and seven of agreement and section 1.4 as well as 2.5 May 9, 2017. Thank you. And here's hoping reasonable minds rule your decision making on Tuesday. And she provides a DHEC link. City has pursued this vision through a number of actions 1.3, instituting regulations and policies for planning, zoning, development, environmental protection, and public safety, developing and maintaining an excellent beach public access system, providing hard erosion control structures on the beach, monitoring beach and dune conditions acting as permit applicant and providing funds for beach nourishment and shoal management projects. 2.5 existing public access and map. Public beach access along the Isle of Palms is excellent. There are 56 public access points along approximately 4.5 miles of shoreline between Breach Inlet and 57th Avenue. Average spacing between public access points is approximately 400 feet. Three Easternmost of the 56 access points between 54th and 57th avenues are actually owned and maintained by the Wild Dunes Community Association, but have no use restrictions and are available to the general public as well. East of 57th Avenue, beach access is available via 14 community access points for residents and guests of Wild Dunes. Average spacing between community access points is approximately 875 feet or one sixth of a mile. Public beach access and parking information is posted on the city's website, and she gives a link for that, and is tabulated in this LCBMP, this section and, in, and appendix. Public beach access locations are also shown on the South Carolina Beach Guide, followed by a link, and figure six taken from the South Carolina Beach Guide. Patrick McLaughlin, what you got? No, I'm sorry. Keep okay. On. Patrick McLaughlin, Mount Pleasant. On the agenda is the parking situation for IOP. It is totally unfair to reduce the allotted parking on IOP. I understand it is an attempt for the council to harness the COVID-19 pandemic, but others in the low country are seeing another underlying element as you have experienced in the media and from the citizens. I suggest you must be fair and meet the citizens halfway. Nothing gets accomplished when citizens are shunned. It leads to a disaster in the long run. I implore you to be open and truthful to the low country and come to an amicable decision. Nancy Middlestadt, Mount Pleasant. As a 37 year resident of Mount Pleasant, I have social distance at the beach every single year. It was easy to do until IOP council banned parking on Palm Boulevard under the guise of the spread of COVID-19. Now all day trippers are bundled into one small area of parking and beach access. This effectively has removed the ability to social distance and greatly increased the possible spread of COVID-19 Please consider removing the real threat of COVID-19 by banning rentals to large out-of-state groups and enforce the mask mandate in the business and restaurant district. Do the right thing instead of seemingly attempting to privatize a public beach, line the pockets of realtors, and land grab right-of-way public roads. Local communities will take every available legal avenue to regain their right to the, their public beaches. Craig Ryman, Mount Pleasant. Privatizing what once was public is brought forth by greed and personal agendas. 
The fact that the council wants to misdirect the public into thinking that they are concerned about another's safety, when in reality, these new restrictions make the beaches a more dangerous place to visit. It concentrates the public to a more confined area of the beach and social distancing is less likely or even more so impossible. Free the beach, access for all, not just some. Abby Rich, uh, James Island, I can't believe that paid parking along Palm Boulevard is even being discussed. This makes the beach private without actually making it private. Everyone is looking at IOP right now to see if they make the right decision for locals. Be for your people. There is plenty of money for your town. Do you really need bigger tasers and even more tricked out golf carts? Please consider people who live off the island. If you do plan on making us pay for parking, then what is your plan for taxes? I would like to see little to none of Mount Pleasant taxes taken out for the beaches since you will be making all this extra money. Uh, Dana Bansgard, Mount Pleasant, please consider opening up some parking. I'm 55, have an autoimmune disorder. I also suffer from depression and anxiety and the beach is such a healing place for me. I have lost my job and I don't have extra money to pay for parking. I understand that you have parking issues and I am asking that you consider letting the community members possibly get a pass of some sort. I know this is a complicated issue. Marianne Weaver, Mount Pleasant, reconsider the parking, the limited parking and increasing rates for South Carolina citizens. It has nothing to do with COVID concerns or you would not allow rentals. This is a public beach. Deborah Merwin, Mount Pleasant, I want to start off by saying I'm tru I truly understand the seriousness of COVID-19. I am at high risk due to a medical condition, so social distance is a must for me. I usually go to the beach four to five times a week to relax and enjoy time with family. With the new parking restrictions in place, I can no longer enjoy the beach. The restrictions you have put into place have created such unnecessary stress for non-IOP residents. Please reevaluate the parking restrictions. There must be a better way. As council members, each of you should go to the public beach parking area during peak hours with your families, get feedback from your family and be honest with yourself about your experience. I would greatly appreciate hearing from each of you about your relaxing day at the beach while trying to social distance in a crowded area. It's important for each of you to experience the frustration non-IOP residents are experiencing. I don't think you can truly understand the frustration of being forced to sit in an area that is overly crowded when three quarters of the beach is empty because you want to keep private for residents of IOP and season renters. Please, please, please make the right decision after spending time on the crowded beach area. Nicole. You're good? We have four minutes left. Okay. <laughs> James Wager, Mount Pleasant, please do not further the divide in Charleston County. The topic of elimination of free parking has caused stress and hatred between Ryland residents and Charleston County residents. It will get worse if you make Palm permanently restricted to paid parking. Do the right thing. Show the community that island residents are not elitist and welcome visitors keep parking free on Palm. Rick Shanley, Isle of Palms. I think the parking regulations worked this weekend. Those that wanted to go to the beach found a way. The beach was far from empty, so all found a way that wanted to. As an aside, the boulevard is clean of trash from those that were not able to park. So there is a benefit besides having plenty of room for first responders. Dandy for Renz, Isle of Palms. I am in hopes that by now you have received overwhelming support for your action, eight to one, to limit parking on the island, thus controlling the crowds. The action has helped protect us, full-time residents, public safety personnel, and visitors alike. The attempt of Mount Pleasant folks to demonstrate their disdain for your actions resulted in less than 0.000035% participation. Again, supporting your actions to be in the best interest of all. Though not on this agenda, I do hope that you will extend those parking restrictions until a vaccine is available and or we can all be relatively certain that the spread is stopped. As per this agenda, I could not find any report regarding the Marina Forum. I assume it will be added to the packet by this afternoon. It has been so long that the event happened. I will try to review all my notes to try and be prepared for your discussion, but the data points devoid of manipulation by one tenant are really needed to do so. Thank you for all you do for the residents of this island and please know we appreciate your hard work and perseverance in this trying pandemic. Joyce Morris, Isle of Palms, please, please, please continue to keep us, the residents of the island safe when you next meet an emergency session. Do not be intimidated by the bullies from off who have decided our neighborhoods should be available for their parking and route behavior. We are not saying they cannot use the beach but they, can, but they need to park in an improved parking lot. 
The sheer volume of beach goers needs to be controlled, especially in this pandemic, so that we do not have dangerous parking and traffic chaos. How dare a small group of social, selfish and irresponsible people having a tantrum think they should make the rules on an island where they do not live. Vincent DeGangi, Isla Palms, I would like to thank the mayor and city council for making the appropriate decisions about parking and controlling access to our city during this unprecedented time. I know these are difficult decisions, but they address the health and well-being of not just our residents, but all residents and visitors to this area. In response to the parking discussions on the agenda, I would ask that you also look to make changes to some of the areas designated as resident parking only. As a resident who lives on one of the busiest beach accesses on the island, the beach side of 42nd Avenue, that you also consider parking on one side of the street, 24 seven resident parking only, and other methods to diminish traffic flow on this small section of the street. By reducing the parking on Palm Boulevard, it drives people to looking for spaces to resident areas to look for parking. The current situation creates an exorbitant amount of traffic in this small residential area with the beach access, access to the CO subdivision, beach equipment drop off for companies and Palm Boulevard parkers, as well as non-residents looking for parking loopholes, hidden spaces. Add to this the possibility of an ADA compliant boardwalk walk that will create another attraction to this already busy section of the street and we have created another public safety issue. Please consider my comments and concerns as you move forward with other changes. Nicole? Yes. 30 minutes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, Nicole, number one, I think we got 137 of the 139 comments. <laughs> it's, I only got 50, but thank you for that vote of confidence. <laughs> um, number one, I hope this proves that all palms is being as transparent as we can by reading everything as they came in. Um, these comments uh, came in from our website. We appreciate all comments and welcome more. Um, as elected officials on the Owl Palms, it is our job to represent the residents of Owl Palms. And we have been overwhelmingly directed by our residents to take these precautions. That's all they are precautions. Are they the right ones? Are they the wrong ones? I wish we all knew. We're just doing what we have been doing with the help of um, Dr. You know, from the MUSC. It's been a, a challenge. It's been a real challenge. Uh, we're not the only beach community taking these precautions. Sullivan's Island, Folly Beach, they did theirs for 60 days. We did ours for 30 days. So again, we're doing what our residents wanted us to do. And I hope that we can find a solution for this pandemic that's overwhelming the world. But thank everybody for writing us. And now let's get on to the real business because I got a lot of people who are not on council, but who are here to talk to us tonight and give us advice. So let's move on to our first uh, order of business, which is ways and means. Mr. Mayor, I could yes. draw as a comment. Sorry, may I, may I make one quick um, comment? Uh, Absolutely. Thank you, because it's related to the public comments. Um, and I certainly agree. We appreciate all of all of the the messages and all of the emails that weren't submitted through the public comment. I think, you know, both from from people who live on Isle Palms and people who don't. Um, there's a lot of, I think, productive dialogue that's, that's at least for the vast majority that people are trying to have, and, and we appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, I know that our protocol is to take the first 30 minutes to read public citizen comments, but when we're in a live session in person, we also ask that people who are making the same comment that's already been said, that, that they, you know, kind of abbreviate their comments or, or merely um, don't even necessarily come up and speak again. And I, I'd like to maybe see if there's a way we can, because we only got through 50 of 140 com comments, you know, we missed the vast majority of comments that came in. And there are other topics that people wanted to speak on that, you know, weren't voiced in this meeting. So um, I don't want to silence anybody and I don't want to reduce any transparency, but I'm actually looking to expose and create greater transparency. Um, and I don't, I'm probably making more work for staff, but I'd suggest maybe in the next meeting, if we have a high volume of comments that we try to aggregate some of the common themes. Um, and I, I, I'm open to staff suggestion or maybe Julia or, or you mayor, but um, so that we can at least get a, a full scope of the comments that came in. I'm um, looking for just making a comment on maybe there's a, a better way that we can cover the full breadth of comments that came in. That's a memory. That's a very good suggestion. Um, however, our, our staff has been extremely overwhelmed. Um, hopefully by the next time we meet, 
maybe some different results would be coming forth and we won't have the amount that we're having now, but it's like we did when we have our in-person public comments, we asked everybody to please not repeat the same thing over and over again. Um, I think Nicole did a great job going straight through the um, emails as they came through. And then the last thing I wanted to do to her right now, I said, all right, I'll take that one away because it didn't, it's already been said. So and again, John, it's a great suggestion and thank you for saying that. Um, let's see what happens over the next, I guess we have three weeks left on our current um, 30 day um, ban. So let's see what happens. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready to move on to uh, ways and means? Yes, sir. I, okay. Good. Mr. Bounds. Yep. So, Ron, if you'll put up the financial results, we'll hit that real quick and then get into the items that we need to vote on, please, sir. Thank you. So just real quick, this is uh, end of June results, which is our uh, city fiscal year. Um, so you'll see revenues on the top left hand side of about 16.1 million. Our budget was about 18.8 .8 rough numbers. So again, COVID was about a 25 ish percent effect on our revenue for the fiscal year 20. You can see our expenditures about 15.6 million to the top right. Our budget was about 22 million. So I mentioned these are preliminary numbers. Um, if you look down at the first bullet um, underneath in June notes, we have you know significant amount more revenue to accrue back into this fiscal year 20. So uh, you'll see revenues up top of we're short about 2.7. If all the revenue comes in like we think it will, we'll only wind up being about 1.9 million short of our budget. So uh, significantly better than where we would have thought we were gonna be a few months ago. Um, you know, on the revenue side and on the expense side, we had certainly had some belt tightening to make sure we were being good stewards. So we have about a million on the expense side, we have about a million to 2 million that will also be accrued back into the fiscal 20 year, mostly to do with the public safety building repair. So third bullet down is tourism revenues are about 25% off for fiscal year 20, which is about where we thought they might be. Uh, for budgeting purposes for fiscal 21, we're also projecting about a 25% reduction uh, from what we would typically receive from a, from a revenue standpoint. As some or most of you are aware and residents may not be, part of the forecasted decline is due to the Charleston County's advisory that there will be no pass through of the ATAX funds for the rest of 20 or 21 until they meet their uh, budgeted number. So that's pretty significant impact for us, about 630,000 over a couple of year period. So ending the fiscal year, the last bullet, we have about $20 million in cash as if the city does with about 7.3 of that being restricted uh, funds. So any questions on the financial results? Ron, you can go ahead and go to the first try on, or David, if you want to share your screen, I'll give you some opening comments. Um, if you want to go ahead and put up your presentation. So Mayor, the first item we have for from the Ways and Means Committee is a consideration of engaging first try on in the amount of 15,000 as a financial advisor to guide and assist with proposed debt issues related to the phase three drainage and marina dock rehabilitation projects. I'll make that in the form of a motion if we can have a second and then I'll provide- Second. Thank you. Discussion. Yeah. So let me say real quick, Mayor, you, you remember from our Ways and Means meeting last week, um, Desiree, Debbie, and I had talked to our banker and two other financial advisors to assist us in the upcoming bond issues. Some of you may be asking, why do we even need a financial advisor? And I was kind of there myself early on thinking we could probably handle some of this ourselves. But this is pretty significant financial commitment when you look at the two bond issues coming up over the course of the, this fiscal year for us. So we interviewed two different financial advisors. I personally <coughs> checked um, some references with regard to first try on that people that I knew that are in the business and it had some um, experience with first try on. I know our water and sewer folks have also used um, first try on from an advisory standpoint. And the, the results and recommendations come back quite glowing from uh, clients and other people in the industry with regard to first try on. I know we had first try on in last year 
somewhere in 2019 in the summer to look at a different product that they have. But today we are looking at them to help us from a financial advisory standpoint on these two bond issues. So to help us get better rates, get them out there, get them sold, get them funded, and to guide us through that process. So we've got David Cheatwood with us, who is a managing director with First Tryon. David has over 14 years of public finance experience directly serving tax exempt borrowers in Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. In his role as a public finance banker, he provides clients with a wide range of services, including evaluating debt capacity, structuring bond issues, monitoring refunding, restructuring opportunities, obtaining credit ratings, and coordinating the bond issuance process. So you've got a presentation that starts on about page 23 in your deck. David's also got it up here for us. So David, thank you so much for joining us and I'll let you take it away right now, please. All right, great. Well, thanks very much, Philip and, and, and Mayor and Council. Good evening. Thanks very much for inviting me to participate in this evening's meeting. Um, uh, Philip and Desiree invited me here tonight just to really give you an overview of our firm. Again, for those um, folks on that were on Council about this time last year, uh, you may remember some of this, as, as Philip noted, presented some information on uh, capital planning, modeling and work on that side. Here we'll talk a little bit more just about the transaction that the city has on the horizon. But uh, this presentation, I wanna give you a, some background of our firm and our experience and what our role is as financial advisor. So I'm gonna go through a, a few slides here. So our firm, uh, First Try and Securities, we're based in Charlotte, North Carolina. That is our main office. We do have an individual that works in Atlanta and Boone and Virginia, but uh, the bulk of our um, uh, people are based in Charlotte. We, we have two parts to our firm. We have uh, the first trying advisor side, which is the side that, uh, that I work on. Uh, that side serves as financial advisor to cities, towns, utility systems, school districts, counties, um, special purpose districts across the Carolinas and Georgia. Um, and then the other side of our firm is a uh, sales and trading side. They, they simply trade bonds, uh, primarily corporate bonds, in the secondary market. We are not an underwriter. We're not a bank. We don't lend money. Um, but we do have this other part of our firm that does, um, that does trade bonds. And, and we view that as um, a value add as it gives us some good intel in the market and where bonds are trading in the market. So those are the two different parts to our firm. I'm gonna to speak to the first round advisors uh, part of that. Um, as a firm, we have all the resources that um, the city would look to and, and want a, uh, a financial advisor to have. And so that comes in the form of some of the external, external resources, whether it's the credit rating agencies, the Bloombergs, uh, some of the software that's out there, as well as some internal sources that we've developed in-house uh, for instance, the capital planning model that we went through last, um, last year, uh, we also have various debt capacity and affordab affordability models of pricing, bond pricing database, refunding monitors. So we have a lot of in-house um, uh, data and intelligence that we've developed over the past several years. Um, you know, and uh, when we are asked, you know, what separates your firm from other financial advisory firms out there? We tend to focus on four key areas. We see these as the four areas that the city would uh, really find most important. And you may value um, some of these more than others, but I think uh, no doubt the first thing out there is experience. Um, so we have a tremendous amount of experience in the Carolinas. Uh, I would say 95% um, of my work is in North and South Carolina, a little the majority of that in South Carolina specifically. Um, the other cities and towns that we work with in your area um, and across the state, we work as uh, service financial advisor to the city of Charleston, town of Mount Pleasant, city of North Charleston, your neighbor Sullivan's Island, uh, Pauley's Island, Folly Beach, Somerville, and then across the state you have Greenville, Rock Hill, Myrtle Beach, and others. And from a county perspective, we work with uh, Charleston, Dorchester, and Berkeley County and others there. So have a, a really big cluster of clients in that greater Charleston area and across the state as well. Um, on a form, firm resources, I touched on that. We have all the resources at our disposal, a really deep bench of uh, financial advisors and professionals that I'll highlight here in just a second. Um, in terms of accessibility, while you can have a firm that has all the experience in the world and resources, if they're not accessible to you, they're not uh, providing very much value. But we are based in Charlotte, as I said, so about three hours or so down the road. 
Um, we're the largest uh, financial advisory firm in terms of number of people in the Carolinas. We really value a high touch um, uh, relationship. We are we come to a lot of city council meetings, doing a lot by Zoom these days, uh, but do a lot of in-person meetings with staff and with elected officials. Uh, as I noted there, we have uh, a lot of clients in your area, so we're often in the area, and that's where we can come by, sit with you. A lot of things are always easier face-to-face, -face or, or, although we're becoming more and more accustomed uh, to some of the online platforms here, but um, really uh, accessible to you. And with the deep bench of professionals, if I'm not available one day, we have other individuals, professionals that are familiar with what the city's doing and what you, the types of bonds you would issue that can step in as well. We have some younger folks, analysts and associates that are really great with all of the modeling and uh, number running and work uh, that's there. And so um, I think accessibility is key and, and we uh, certainly feel like we checked that box. And then lastly, enthusiasm. Um, this is one that's hard to measure and it's maybe hard to come across over a Zoom meeting, but um, you know, we just think you know, day in and day out, we're always thinking about our clients, what are better ways to do something uh, while we may work kind of regular hours in the eight to six range, we're, we're constantly thinking about ways to um, improve and um, help our clients. And that uh, means at night or on the weekend. And so hopefully my enthusiasm comes through on that. Uh, we love uh, working with folks like you, I have a lot of um, good experience uh, doing that. And, um, and so I think those are the four key areas. I do want to focus a little bit on the experience. Just I'm going to skip a slide and go back. Um, but this is our experience. You're not going to be able to read this map. This map was a little bit easier to read a couple of years ago when we had less clients, but we have been fortunate and been able to grow our client base. Um, but what you'll find here is the heavy focus in the Carolinas. Over the past couple of years, we have started to drift down into Georgia some, and so we've started to build our practice out there. But there's a, a very big cluster in that Charleston area as well, also in the upstate What's probably more impactful for you is just, and I'll blow this up a little bit more, the other South Carolina cities uh, and counties utility systems, uh, our Palms Water and Sewer Commission included in that. I know a few folks on online from the commission here. Um, you know, when you all look to hire uh, a firm, I think you can look at, you know, see different things from the other financial advisors about their experience, the number of deals they do, the amount, the total par amount of deals they work on, their number of clients. In my opinion, um, being a city in South Carolina, your most kind of spot on comparables and what you want out of a firm is a firm that works with a lot of cities uh, and towns across the state. And so just to give you a couple of data points, again, you can see the list of the cities there and certainly cover a lot in your area. Um, and looking at the top population, I know population wise, you all are not one of the top um, in, in the state, you serve a big population, especially in the summer months, but uh, just one metric in looking at the top 10 cities across the state in terms of population, we are a financial advisor to eight of those 10 cities. If you um, go down a little bit further and look at the top 20, we're, uh, we advise 14 of those 20 cities. So we have a lot of experience. And what that helps, um, something like the, the, the city of Isle Palms is we are in the market constantly with bond issues, both in the public market and in the bank market. And so when we are bidding out deals for our clients, and, and this has been a very active past couple of months for bond issues, both new money and re refinancings alike, we are bidding out two to three of these a week. And so we have a lot of market intelligence that comes in. We know what banks are bidding, what banks aren't bidding in a given week where interest rates are, any sort of terms or conditions they're looking for, any sort of hot button topics to avoid or address um, head on. And so I think that's really where the value add is on the advisory side uh, to someone like you all is just our work with other cities and towns on similar deals, the general obligation bond deal, uh, like y'all are considering uh, water and sewer in the case of uh, the, the commission there. And so we have a lot of direct on point experience, which is, really what you look for, I would think, in hiring a financial advisor. Um, let me go back out to um, one of our uh, kind of main slides here. What's your role? What does a financial advisor do? Um, what I've given you here is, you know, we tend to take a three-pronged approach, um, sorry, uh, take a three-pronged approach to serving our clients. And I'll tell you, these three different areas, not all clients need uh, advice or help in each of these areas. And so I want to focus on 
the city here, which y'all are going to fall in that middle area. That said, we do a lot of pre-planning work. You saw, uh, for those that were on council last year, some of that, uh, an example of some of that uh, modeling work we do, planning work, debt capacity, affordability, looking at different financing alternatives. Basically, where do you get from, hey, we have this project need, we have these other project needs out there, how do we fund that? Y'all have really gotten through that pre-planning stage, you're at that middle stage, which is transaction implementation. And so um, how we, you know, we have various bullets there on kind of what that entails. And I've, I've highlighted a couple that I wanted to emphasize. The first, it sounds really simple, develop a financing schedule. Um, that said, there are some nuances to that, especially in the current market. If you're doing a, um, a bank place transaction where you send out a bank RFP, uh, the little nuances associated with that are some banks may bid on your deal, but they only hold their rate for 24 hours or 48 hours. And so some of that scheduling and making sure you have your approvals in place and you're in a position to accept bids when they come in has uh, taken on greater importance over the last couple of months. Uh, with some of the volatility that's out there, banks, uh, several banks are holding their rates for shorter and shorter periods of time. Um, review bond and closing documents, again, fairly straightforward, but can provide some value there. Your, your bond council will draft your bond ordinance for your general obligation issue. Uh, we review that on your behalf um, and may provide some, some options that give you a little bit of flexibility or address some of the things that are happening in, in the current environment. Um, the, the main thing I think that we'll focus on here, uh, if, we, if the city was to hire us, would be that bank RFP and distribution. And so we put together uh, request for proposals that gives banks all of the information they're going to want to know to bid on your deal. And that's just the size of your deal, the term or different options of terms that we want to uh, get bids on, the security structure, the use of proceeds, and some of the other items that they'll be looking for in that we then distribute that bank RFP to a list of a long list of local, regional, and national banks. And so we, uh, our list right now is is over 50 banks. Um, I don't want to tell you that um, you know make you think we're going to get 50 bids in because we won't. Right out of the gate, we know certain banks aren't interested in a particular type of deal or a deal that goes over 10 years. And so right out of the gate. Um, we know that's not, the, um, we're not going to get in that many bids. We still send it to that many because you never know um, kind of week to week which banks are interested and which banks are going to bid. And so banks, like it or not, once they get on our list, uh, we don't take them off unless they go out of business. Um, so we want to make sure we cover the waterfront. And so that way, when, when bids come in, we can come to you, your staff can come to you and tell you, this is the best deal that's in the bank market out there. You are ensuring you're getting the best deal. Could you, you all could certainly send the bank RFP out on your own, but it's really making sure we've got the right banks on the list, knowing which banks are bidding and kind of addressing any sort of um, things they want to address, negotiate any terms or conditions. So I think that's a value add um, in this particular case. I'll give you another data point, um, you know, when you talk about financial advisory fee, that's always a big thing. What are you going to charge on this? Um, I want to kind of relate that to your total financing cost and, and, and how that relates. And so if you all are looking to borrow roughly, I believe about $6.3 million for some drainage and uh, marina improvements there, and your term could be around 15 years. To give you an idea of the sensitivity of what the interest rate impact is, about one basis point difference on your interest rate is equal to about $5,000. So to say that another way, if, if, if we're able to bring a bank to the table that can, that you otherwise was not on your list, that um, is able to give you an interest rate that's just three basis points lower than what you would have gotten perhaps on your own, right there we are paying for ourselves. Now I'm always hesitant to, um, to note that because it, I will tell you uh, on the front end, we cannot guarantee that a bank that we put on the list and, and have out there will give you the lowest rate. Again, the only thing we can ensure and promise is that we'll get it in all the right hands and you get in uh, the lowest rate that's out there. Uh, and then of course, last, lastly, we run all the numbers associated with uh, the deal, all the bond numbers and tax numbers that will be needed for the closing documents. Um, Post-transaction questions come up. Uh, we're certainly available to help. Um, we try to keep you informed of what's going on in the market, any other sort of regulatory um, news, uh, credit news that's out there. But that's our general approach uh, to our financial advisory relationships and then specific to the city. 
And just to reiterate, I don't think I mentioned this on the front end, you know, we have a fiduciary duty to act in your best interest. We sit on your side of the table. As I mentioned, we don't lend, we're not an underwriter. And so our goal is simply to make sure we are addressing your needs and objectives and um, um, again, no other ulterior motives there. Um, I will skip ahead a little bit to our team. As I mentioned, we have a very deep bench uh, of, of professionals here. We have some of our more senior professionals, uh, myself, um, my colleague, Walter Goldsmith, who started uh, this financial advisory practice several years back. Uh, my colleague, Amy Vittner. Amy works with the Water and Sewer Commission uh, and then several other folks there at, at various levels. So very deep bench across the board with a variety of background and experience. A little bit more information on ours. Uh, Philip um, was nice enough to give a little background on, on myself. I've worked uh, practice law for a few years, worked on the investment banking side of Bank of America and Wells Fargo, and then switched over to the financial, financial advisory side back in 2015. And again, work with a number of those entities in your area and across the state. And just to give you a little bit of flavor, this is my last slide here, and I'm, I'm happy to take some questions, but some other, um, what we've listed here, some other South Carolina general obligation bond experience. If we expanded this list to some other non-general obligation um, transactions that we're working on, we could fill up a few more pages, but this will give you an idea of what your counterparts across the state are doing. Uh, we're doing a couple of different bond issues for the city of Florence right now. Those are in process, both new money and a refunding. Uh, we are working on one with Folly Beach at the moment, closing that in a couple of weeks. Just closed one last week for the city of Greer. Uh, we have done several uh, for the city of um, Charleston, Anderson, Mount Pleasant. I'll tell you our experience um, looking at our client list, while I mentioned some of those top cities, we work with a number of smaller cities population wise. And you can see just from this uh, you know, they can be the smaller variety, the $2 million financings up to we'll do hundreds of millions of dollars in financing. So it really runs the gamut from a, um, a size of the issuer, size of the borrowing, different types. And we love doing that. We don't just focus on big issuers. We have smaller ones because that gives us a variety of experience and um, kind of done the pigeonholes one way or the other. Um, but I'll pause there and hopefully that gives you some good background and information on our firm. Uh, Philip, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have or uh, other council members may have as well. Yeah. Okay. Mayor, uh, we can open it up for questions if you want or however you want to proceed. Okay. Do we have any questions? I think that was a great presentation, David. I mean, very impressive. And the communities you represent are all top notch, you know, local communities we all know and respect. So thank you very much for that presentation. Um, questions from anyone from uh, council, please. Hearing none, Philip? Yep, hey David, uh, thank you so much for hanging in there with us the way we kicked off the meeting. Sorry about that, a little bit of delay in getting you going, but thank you for prepping with us and doing the presentation and staying with us tonight. So I appreciate that. Well, you're <laughs> run like the wind, man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot. Thanks very much for having me and, and giving me the opportunity. We love, uh, we would love to work with the city and help you all in this space. All right, David. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. So, Mayor, we do need to vote on this tonight, please. Okay. So, you did make a motion or not make a motion, sir? I yes. did. Who seconded that motion? Give me Ward. Okay. Uh, here, no other questions. All <laughs> those favor, signify. Uh, let's do it. Roll call. Vote, yes, please. Councilmember Bell. Aye. Councilmember Streetman. Aye. Councilmember Pounds. Aye. Councilmember Moy. Aye. Councilmember Popson. Aye. Councilmember Smith. You're on mute. <laughs> Got it. She says aye. Councilmember Buchanan. Aye. Mayor Carroll. Aye. All in favor? Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you all for that. Um, our next Can I vote? Oops, oh, sorry. <laughs> Who did I forget? <laughs> Ward. Oh, Council Reward. I'm sorry. Aye. Thank you. He seconded it and voted aye. So, Very good. Our second item is consideration of request from the IOP Water and Sewer Commission for approval of a $16 million bond issue for the decommissioning and relocation of the Wild Dunes Wastewater Treatment Plant. Mayor, I'll make that in form of a motion. Fair. Second. Council second. Member, council member Ward made a second. Yep. Discussion. Yep. So real quick, Mayor, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, 
previous council members know in 2019, this request came up. There are a number of questions at that time. So COVID hits and we're just now coming back to it in July. Um, there's been some staff turnover and commissioner turnover at the Water and Sewer Commission. So Chris, I will let you take take it away and introduce your team. There's a presentation on about page 40 or so. Ron, I know you'll put this up as well and walk through it. So Chris, take it away. Okay, thank, thank you, Philip. I'm gonna let Jay kind of kick it off and then we'll run through the presentation. Okay, hey Jay, sorry, I didn't know you were there. That's no, fine, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity of uh, presenting this again and Nicole, uh, kudos. Thank you. <laughs> um, we, uh, again, from the Ways and Means Committee meeting last week, uh, we're getting ready what, what we already requested from you and bring it to the full council. But to beat a dead horse into the ground, I would like to extend one more time for any of the council members that have not taken the tour uh, to please come and see what, what we're really looking at. Um, I think Councilmember Bell and Streetman got an eyeful and perhaps a nurse <laughs> the other day. So um, it, it's, it's worth, worth the hour. Uh, also on standby, we have our uh, engineer, Mark Yotis, our rate consultant, Frank, Thanks. and um, Bill Youngblood, our bond attorney. So any questions you may have for those guys, they will be available to answer it. And I will turn it over to Chris and we will see you after a while. All right. Well, thanks, Ron, for putting the uh, slideshow up again and handling everything. But uh, we're here to uh, request for approval of $16 million bond issue for wastewater plant consolidation. Go to the next slide. Um, there's several steps involved in, in you know, doing what we're wanting to do. Um, you know, number one, we have to build a pump station at the Wild Dunes wastewater plant to pump influent from Wild Dunes to forest trails for treatment. Uh, we got to consolidate all that capacity at the forest trail site. When we do that, um, it'll take that treatment capacity at forest trails to 1.4 million gallons per day. And then the last thing that we would need to do would be to decommission the treatment plant at Wild Dunes. Um, to consolidate, we need city council to approve uh, their a bond ordinance for the issuance of the bonds. Um, these are revenue bonds. They're paid solely from the revenues generated by the Water and Sewer Commission. They don't impact the credit or the taxing power of the <coughs> way they show up on our balance sheets, not the city's financials. But, um, and this series 2020 bonds, this is will be the eighth issue of bonds, revenue bonds under the city's existing ordinance. Um, to issue these bonds, the commission uh, did a rate study and uh, on the 17th of June, 2020, the commission approved that rate study, which had involved a rate increase that went into effect July the 1st of this year. Um, they, um, I think y'all have seen the rate study and there were a couple of different options and they chose the option two, which uh, just to give you an example, it was the impact on the average user of the Isle of Palms who uses about 6,000 gallons a month, you, they'd only see about a dollar and 60 cent increase in their sewer charges. There's no increase in the water charges, but it is important to note that that's the increases this year. Um, we have incremental increases um, scheduled for the next five years, which are about the same amount as roughly about a two and a half percent increase in sewer charges um, each year for the next five years. And then we would look at it and see where we are and you know, adjust accordingly. Hopefully uh, future rate increases wouldn't, wouldn't be as much, but it's a pretty nominal increase, cost of living increase, basically. So if you go to the next slide. Um, the timeline of consolidation, um, when hopefully city council approves the bond ordinance, uh, it takes about three minutes to complete um, and issue the bonds. We already have the land disturbance permit Stormwater NPDES permit is in hand, so we can start construction immediately. Design's underway. We're putting the finishing touches on it, but we're just waiting to finalize it, you know, until the bonds are approved. And if everything works out, the construction would start in early 2021 and take about 18 months to build the facility. Um, building the pump station at Wild Dunes to pump the influent from Wild Dunes to Forest Trails. Um, we already have that design has been finalized. The permit has been issued um, 
and we're just waiting on the bond issue to be approved before we pull the trigger. And that isn't part of the of the 16 million plus the additional funds and the grant money for the total project. This is a, a capital project that's already been budgeted and approved in our regular uh, capital improvement plan for this year. So um, that's not included in it, but it is, it's part of our existing capital plan. Um, just to consolidate it at, at Forest Trails, there's a lot of things that are gonna be built, a lot of tanks, a lot of screening, um, some of the big ticket items that we really focus a lot on are the odor control, um, the noise, we're, we're you know, just trying to soundproof everything. Um, the, we actually have to, we don't have to, but we'll pump water back to um, the wastewater plant in Wild Dunes so that the golf course can irrigate, which they currently do now. They, ir they land apply the effluent. Um, but it's a, a good thing because we'll be able to enhance flood project, uh, protection and um, you know, just better uh, secure the facility against inclement weather and some of the flooding issues that we have at Wild Dunes. So you go to the next slide. Benefits of con consolidation, um, you know, obviously we would reduce our personnel costs, training costs, and just running one type of wastewater process testing costs because we'll be sampling just at one facility um, and uh, we'd be able to meet, you know, current codes and definitely the flood, uh, flood proofing is uh, an ability to do that at the consolidated plant is a lot, uh, you know, definitely important thing. Um, the effluent quality of the MBR process, um, it's, it's, it's high quality effluent and um, we, if we were to have to increase our charge in the future, if we added on any additional sewer customers, we wouldn't have to modify our existing NPD permit. And when we consolidated forest trails, um, well, when we replaced forest trails, the existing plant, uh, we had consolidation in mind. And a lot of people kind of ask the question, you know, if you, the first plant costs roughly seven and a half, eight million dollars to build for 350,000 gallons of treatment, how can you, for you know, eight, uh, sixteen million dollars? How can you, uh, you know, bring an additional million gallons of treatment? Well, the existing structure, we can take that plant to seven hundred thousand gallons a day without building another structure. We just have to drop additional equipment in place. So, um, what when we do the consolidation, what you see down there today, if you double that, that put that mirror image right beside it, that brings us to the one point four million. Uh, gallons of treatment and that takes care of all the existing treatment that is on the island today that's not counting expanding and adding on additional customers um, you know there's some remaining capacity that is still remaining on the Isle of Palms and down in Wild Dunes you know for example the new hotel you know they they uh, just going to bring additional flow but uh, one thing to note about them is for them to tie on to the system uh, just in water and sewer impact fees, they paid the commission uh, roughly about $450,000 but because of the impact that they will have on the system. You go to the next slide. Some of the uh, consequences of delay in the project, uh, we're spending a lot of money on, on the upkeep of the Wild Dunes plant. We currently got a contractor down there replacing a lot of the handrails uh, on the taller of the two structures for the ones who've been down there on the tour um, that taller tank um, we started replacing some of those handrails and the contractor we talked to him he started on Monday and they're having trouble finding good metal to weld some of those you know just basic safety elements of the plant so we're actually removing all the handrails and installing all new handrails just because there's nothing for them to piece together uh, that's going to run the cost of the project up a little bit but it's a safety issue so we're definitely going to take care of it um, you know, if we continue to delay, we continue to see flooding issues that we see down in Wild Dunes and the increased construction costs, uh, the, it's, it's just going to cost more for us to, to build the plant the longer we wait. And then the timeline is ticking on the $2.25 million FEMA grant that we've got uh, to re relocate the Wild Dunes treatment at the Forest Trail site. So that's important to bring up. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, decommissioning the 
the wastewater plant. Um, just go ahead and play. Yeah, that's the headworks of the plant. That's the first tank that was built, and it was built in the late 70s. Um, it's a steel structure. That's the headworks. Um, that's where all the influent comes. We screen it uh, and we pump it to the two treatment tanks. The developer, the original developer, Wild Dunes, when he brought the tanks in, they they were used when he brought them here. They were, you know, have been in, a, you know, in service at some other facility, and he brought, you know, cut them up, brought them here, reassembled them. But then in the late '90s, we covered that structure and installed the odor control unit that you see off to the left just to treat some of the odors that come off the headworks. Go to the next slide. That's 450,000 gallon treatment plant. It was installed in the early 80s. Um, it's a packaged treatment plant. What that means is all the all the levels of treatment are in one tank. Um, you know, you've got aeration tanks on the outside, a clarifier in the middle where you see that clear water and it's all contained in that one tank. You just flip to the next slide. And that's the 500,000 gallon treatment plant. As the development grew, um, the, the developer brought in, had to add additional capacity. So they brought in and built this tank and all these tanks, we periodically taken them out of service and done a lot of steel work on them. You can see a lot of the kind of rusty metal there. Um, there's some, it's just uh, hard to, hard to kind of really get, you know, see what you're dealing with it. When you get up on the tanks, you definitely kind of see the rust and the, the issues with the steel. Jeff, you can flip to the next slide. That's the, uh, that's the 450,000 gallon tank. Those handrails are in a little bit better shape, but the rust is working away on them, as you can see. And if y'all have any questions, we'll try and answer them for you. And we've got the other people here who uh, be able to help us out. Hey, Chris, go ahead and run through the cost breakdown if you don't mind real quick. Yeah, Ron, if you could bring that up, that's the, that's the additional, that's the slide we didn't have. Slide right after questions, Ron. Thank you. Yeah, that's the cost breakdown of the of the consolidation. You got the cost of the project is almost nineteen million dollars less than the grant of the two point two five and some internal funds that will be kicking in. Uh, and that's the, the cost to kind of break down the structure with the, you know, you can see the, just the, the basin, just constructing those big concrete basins is a, is a big chunk of, chunk of money out of the total project, but that's the breakdown. Thank you, Chris. So Mayor, we can go to questions if you want to now. Okay, you just go to the full screen so we can see everybody. Okay, question. Councilman Streetman. Well, I think Council Member Bale had his hand I, up. I can't, I'm Probably. sorry, I can't see everybody. No okay, okay. Well, let me, let me say first that, uh, you know, that uh, I, I want to personally thank Chris and Jay and Bill and Dana for showing Randy and I around the, uh, the plants the other day on one of the hottest days that we've had so far. And it was not only an eye opener, but it was a nose opener as well, particularly when you got to Wild Dunes. And, uh, but I gotta tell you, I mean, the forest trail plant is state of the art, the way it looks. And I, you know, it absolutely, we were out there for probably an hour, odorless, quiet, well-run, very professional. We looked at everything out there. This guy showed us around and it's just, uh, I mean, it's put together very well. When we got to Wild Dunes and looked at that and, you know, we did the upstairs tour on top of those tanks. And uh, it's it's an eye opener. I mean, it really is something that uh, you know that we need to deal with, and we need to deal with effectively. And I know it's going to cost us a little money, you know, for people on, on sewer, and, you know, and, and looking forward to what we need to do with the with you know with the the rates and that sort of thing. But it is definitely a situation in wild dunes that we need to address. Uh, being on this beautiful island we live on. It's the right thing to do, and I just uh, I think that uh, uh, even though we might need more detail behind the numbers, uh, you know, the breakdown, and you know, it, I feel good about the working relation relationship going forward with Chris and Jay and those guys from what I gathered the other day. That's all I'll have to say. 
<laughs> well, I just want to note, uh, I let Rusty go first this time. I also offered to let him go first when Chris <laughs> advised us that the water was drinking water quality coming <laughs> And, and he declined that one, Chris. I, don't, uh, <laughs> I know. I remember. Yeah, you gave him the chance. I you did. didn't drink it either. <laughs> yeah, he didn't take it up. No, no. Just a couple of comments. Um, uh, Councilman Streetman's dead on. It, anyone that tours that wild dunes plant and climbs those stairs and witnesses, uh, particularly on a 95 degree day, is going to understand that we, we don't have an option but to deal with that particular plant. My only uh, going forward comments and concerns that I that I made in Ways and Means meeting. The funding model itself places the entire burden on already connected um, sewer customers. And I would encourage through work with the MOU and through work with water and sewer that we look at a broader perspective because the disincentive for 1400 septic systems to join up is huge. It's financially overbearing for a lot of people. Um, I think I'm one of two council members on the sewer system right now. It's expensive. And I think it's in the best interest of the island to come up with a way collectively between council and the Water and Sewer Commission to begin incenting to address an island-wide problem. Um, I'm certainly not gonna vote against this, but I, I still don't like the funding model and uh, do appreciate the concern expressed. I talked to Jay Lee about it. I've talked to Chris about it, uh, but Anyone who hasn't gone over there from council, uh, you should sign up and uh, take Rusty back over there with you for the first drink, I guess. <laughs> Number one, th thank you both for going down there. Desiree and I went down there yeah. and it was quite a tour, but it wasn't summertime. So you get a medal for doing that. Uh, are there any other council members with questions? Uh, just one. Yes, sir. <clears throat> council member again. I think one of the things, and Randy brings up a good point on, you know, the, in the cost being spread out, but I think one of the biggest things we need to look at, we have 153, 153 rooms, new rooms going in to Wild Dunes at the, with a new hotel. That's gonna impact that sewer system as well. Um, and so we need to, you know, calibrate for that. And like I said, you know, the, the forest trail is so efficient in what they do and so clean <laughs> and so quiet. Um, it's it's it really is a no-brainer in the efficiency of that that plant and what what it's capable of doing any other council members uh one quick uh, yeah councilman streetman second one. yeah i just wanted to i meant to bring this up but ryan good work on the tile in the restroom <laughs> all right thank you so chris just to really bring it back to real life we're in hurricane season this is system is very fragile or bill jenkins i mean you know the system better than anybody i know i think uh, how critical is it? this is a, on a one to ten a 20. well it's definitely up there um i mean you know it's 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 outlived its useful life almost we've squeezed about every single gallon pushed through that plant that we can and uh, you know, just, we've had this, this plan has been on our capital improvements plan for quite some time and we're just ready to pull the trigger on it. So we hope that we can get the bond ordinance approval and get going on it um, as soon as we can. My it, last would, it, would, it would be a new definition of storm surge. <laughs> <laughs> my last yeah. question, Mark and everybody, thank you for being here. Bill, this is my question to you. Are we gonna have basketball this year? Are you asking Bill Youngblood? Yes, sir. I'm asking Bill Youngblood. Where are my cougars? <laughs> I don't know, Mayor. I don't know. I think there'll be basketball, but I don't know that you and I will be in the stands. Okay. All right. Let's go back to business. Philip? Yep, Mayor. That's, uh, that's really it. So if we don't have any other questions, Chris and team, really appreciate your help over the last month and a half or more as we've been prepping for ways and means. I know it's redundant to have to do ways and means in council, but we really appreciate you guys' efforts in joining us tonight. Jay, any last closing commentary before we let you guys go? No, I, I think I think it's been well covered, just other than to say that uh, we, we have a diminished return in wild dunes. Uh, to say functionally obsolete is lightly. So I, I think everybody, I believe, is in agreement with what we need to do to move forward and looking forward to approval 
of the uh, of the request. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Mayor. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. I think we have a a motion and a second, and I think we've all discussed it. We vote. Can we go by unanimous consent? Desiree, what do you think? Councilmember Bell? Aye. Councilmember Streetman? Aye. Councilmember Popson? You're on mute. Aye. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Smith? Aye. Councilmember Buchanan? Aye. Councilmember Pounds? Aye. Councilmember Ward? Aye. Councilmember Moy? Aye. Mayor Carroll? Aye. All in favor? Thank you very much. You know, Mr. Mr. Yep. Thank you, Jay and team. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you all. Mayor, Mayor? Yes, sir. I, I just wanted to clarify as your bond council, the, the motion was to give first reading to the bond ordinance, as I understand it. Yes, yes. Oh. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do the first reading in a moment. We were just uh, officially approving it on behalf of council right then. That's right. Yeah, it's thank on you. the agenda bill for later on. Yeah. Gotcha. For, thank you. Yep. Thank you, <coughs> Mayor. I'll just keep rocking real quick. Couple yes, other sir. Items. Please do keep rocking. Yep. I'm going as fast as I can, man. Item three: consideration of engaging Hainsworth Sinkler Boyd as real estate attorney to assist in the development of the Marina Restaurant Lease document. I'll make that in form of a motion. Second. Okay. You've got a document in your package um, that outlines what we're doing here. Again, I think it's smart money to bring in a real estate professional to help us finalize this lease language uh, on behalf of the city, Desiree or Julia. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to this. I see one head nod. Nope, nope. So, Mayor, that's it. Okay, questions? Anything else? I hear nothing else. Let's do a roll call vote. Councilmember Ward. Aye. Councilmember Moy? Aye. Councilmember Pounds? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Thank you. Councilmember Popson? Aye. Councilmember Buchanan? Aye. Councilmember Streetman? Aye. Councilmember Bell? Aye. Mayor Carroll? Aye. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Item four is consideration of a change order in the amount of 66,500 for applied technology management contract for additional services related to the Marina dock rehabilitation project really falls into three different buckets of work, if you will. The water wastewater permitting, the pump out grant application and construction administration services. So I'll make that in the form of a motion, Mayor. Second. We have a motion and second. Discussion. Mayor, just real quick, the bulk of this um, 66,000 is for constru construction administration services just to help us oversee the redo of the docks. I think we certainly have created the right model in the public safety building to have some professional overseeing what's going on day to day down there. So that's the bulk, about 55,000 Desiree, I think if I'm right on that, on this particular contract, the rest of it's about 5,600 each for the other two pieces. So just for clarification. Very good clarification. What's your saying? Hit me once, shame on you. Hit me twice, shame on me. We're not yes. going to do that again. Okay, any other discussion? Hearing none. Roll call, please. Councilmember Bell? Aye. Councilmember Streetman? Aye. Councilmember Popson? Aye. Councilmember Buchanan? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Councilmember Pounds? Aye. Councilmember Ward? Aye. Councilmember Moy? Aye. Uh, Mayor Carroll? Aye. Thank you, everybody. All in favor? Thank you. And not to sell through the close, but that is a budgeted item. We've, we've come in under budget on the um, project, so we should be good there. Also on this next one, item five, consideration of a change order for Thomas and Hutton contracting the amount of 30,000 for bidding and construction services regarding the phase three small internal drainage project. So mayor, I'll make that in form of a motion. Second. Um, Desiree, before we go further with this, did we have a question on this as for, um, is this one of the ones that we wanted to hold off on or go no. for? Next one, mayor. 
All right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, real quick, just point of clarification on this one. You know, this is not the big phase three drainage that, you, that we're issuing bonds on. These are the small internal projects that we've tagged about 500,000 in our budget for next year. The Thomas and Hutton bid has come in at about 460 ish thousand. So we've got room to do this again, oversight uh, from a RFP bidding standpoint and construction oversight for us. And just real quick, these are five projects. Um, Sparrow Drive drainage improvement, Forest Trail drainage improvement, Cross Lane drainage improvement, 32nd Avenue drainage improvements, and 41st Avenue driveway pipe drainage improvements. So some pretty significant projects that'll happen over the course of the next year or so. Desiree, what do you wanna add there? I just wanna clarify that the 464,000 um, figure that's included in your packet as part of that proposal, in the um, refined estimates for the construction of that work, we still have to go through um, bidding and selecting the proper contractor who would do that work. But um, they they do a quite a quite amount of uh, quite amount of work, um, and their estimates are usually on point. So we feel confident that the um, five hundred thousand that is budgeted would cover um, that important work. And like you said, it's always very, it's always good to have an expert oversee these construction projects to ensure that they are done um, in accordance to the permits and according to the specifications. And we've worked with Thomas and Hutton in the past and have a great relationship with them. And they've done a great, uh, wonderful job to the city so far. Got some more words, did I see your hand up? Yes, sir. I had a question. Uh, Mr. Pound said, Mr. Pound said, over the next year or next year? I hope he said these projects will be carried out over the next year. Yeah, definitely in within the next fiscal year, Jimmy. Yeah, and I guess Desiree, Not, what's your guess on start date on these five projects? Any Bill or Douglas? Um, well, I, I guess you know we'd have to take into consideration the pro the time it takes them to get the documents in order. Um, we put out a, a, the RFP packet out, leave about three to four weeks for enough time for contractors to issue bids. We get the bids review them and then council still, still needs to approve that. So at least 45 days would believe just for bidding. Um, Douglas, do you have any thoughts on timeline of the actual construction once they're ready to go? I think they've said about eight months of actual construction. So we, we should be done completely finish and close out this fiscal year. Yeah. Jimmy, does that get your, that answer? Yes, sir. That? Thank okay. you. This this fiscal year. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any Alvin. other questions? Hearing none. Roll call. Uh, Councilmember Ward. Aye. Councilmember Moy. Aye. Councilmember Pounds. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Councilmember Popson. Aye. Councilmember Buchanan. Aye. Councilmember Streetman. Aye. Councilmember Bell. Aye. Mayor Carroll. Aye. All in favor. Thank you. Item six, Mayor, this is the one. Consideration of a three-year extension of the EDS con construction group contract for island-wide drainage and ditch maintenance. This one we would like to defer and we'll take it back through public works uh, just to have a little more due diligence. I thought we might have more information either Friday or yesterday, but we just need to defer this one and take it back through the public works crowd. And just to, for clarification, this has nothing to do with the quality of work of EDS. We just need more clarification. Yeah, and work will continue, Mayor, around the island just on a um, bid, ba not a bid basis, but a job basis, I guess, for lack of a better term, Desiree. So we yeah. won't stop work and ongoing maintenance from EDs. We just want a little bit more time to define that next three year extension, Mayor. Thanks. Thank you. Keep on, sir. This contract um, expired this summer, and we just want to make sure, although the contract does include an extension provision, as long as both parties are in agreement, we're just going through the scope and making sure that the needs we had three years ago, there's still you know the same needs we have today. If there's any um, changes that we need to make um, to do that before we present it to council, we wanted to you know just have a little bit more time to to do that before before we make a recommendation. But um, yeah, we love EDs. We very very um, uh, happy with the work that they do, and um, they'll continue to do work um, in the next month. We, we're hoping that we can get this all wrapped up by August. Right, Donnie? This tie is killing him. 
<laughs> I saw a thumbs up though, Mayor, from him. Um, one more item, seven, discussion and consideration of Marina restaurant lease proposal from the IOP Families Investment Group. As everyone knows, there have been ongoing negotiations over the last week since our Ways and Means Committee. We are close to finalizing this deal and we'll take this up in an executive session to finalize the financial arrangements a little bit later tonight. So Mayor, if I can just hit a couple of really quick items from the Ways and Means meeting that we did not have to vote on tonight. Yes, uh, we renewed the contract with Renicus, which is the short-term rental helper software, which is more than paid for itself. Um, that helps us find folks that are in violation of not being properly licensed. We had a discussion with, around Dominion Energy's non-standard service fund and discussion of developing a cutting agreement between the city and D Dominion ahead of the next tree trimming cycle. And we will send this back through Public Works as well to create some strategy around what we wanna do with that non-standard service fund monies and put a strategy wow. together around whether it's undergrounding or lighting or whatever it may be, we'll, we'll work that through the Public Works Committee. Um, and then our next meeting is Tuesday, August 18th at 6 p.m. Mayor, and that's it. That's a great, any questions for Mr. Chairman? Hearing none, public work, public safety. <laughs> public works. Yep, public safety. Hey. Public safety. Oh, I'm looking down too far. Public safety, Mr. McCann. You got it, thank you, Mayor. Public safety committee met um, Monday, July 6th at 9 a.m. All committee members were present as well as administration. And we had a presentation by Stuart Day from um, Stantec. We had a number of citizens comments um, that were made part of the record. We went through and um, had some discussion under old business, um, new business. We had discussion of eliminating parking in the land. There was a <clears throat> there was a motion to, in the previous emergency meeting to discussion of eliminating parking on the land side of Palm Boulevard between 22nd and 40th Avenues. We brought that up in, under discussion. Uh, the administrator reported that she had a meeting with SCDOT to discuss the potential changes to the parking, the city's parking plan to ensure that the city would have uh, required amount of parking to basically meet the needs and qualify for federal uh, renourishment monies. Um, Stuart Day of Stantec reviewed the DHEC coach, the RM Beach public beach access facility classification and um, said the city will have ample amounts of parking to qualify for that funding of the parking on the land side of Palm was eliminated. Um, we went on and had um, more discussion about that and we are still looking at, you know, the pros and cons of um, either having it, what is the best way to manage it. As you know, that we went through and um, kind of alleviated a lot of the issues that we had with putting out the uh, signs for no double or no triple parking and that um, helped out with a lot of congestion in that area. We had discussions regarding managed beach parking plan and implementing the paid parking on the designated beach um, parking zones. And this is a project that we had started, oh Lord, months ago working with DOT to try to find ways to what we can do as a city and work with the SCDOT to improve our rights of ways, improve our shoulders, improve the um, areas that folks are coming to and, and parking alongside the alongside the rights of way right now. And um, we've never been able to utilize paid parking to help help offset those costs. And DOT has now lifted some of the regulations that allow us to implement paid parking. Um, Desiree, I know you would wanted to go through and touch base on this as well. I don't know if you um, want to jump in here on this one. Sure. Um, yes, um, Council Member Buchanan. Um, well, we were asked several months ago to look into a develop a plan to implement paid parking on Palm Boulevard, and that's the presentation that's included in your packet. Um, we went through this presentation during the Public Safety Committee meeting, and um, I don't want to unless I'm asked, I don't want to go through the whole presentation, but mostly we, we need direction from council on a couple of things. One is the location in which council would like to implement pay parking on Palm, uh, pay parking. Um, currently there are several areas that are free beach parking. Um, those include Palm Boulevard between 21st and, and 40, 40th Avenue, and also the land side of Palm between 41st and 57th. 
and sections of road between Third Avenue and Ninth Avenue. So those are currently available for for, park, for, for parking at no cost. Um, the question was asked, you know, can the city do this? And we certainly talked to DOT, and like Councilmember Buchanan indicated, they have um, eased some of the requirements um, that they had implemented or indicated in the in the past, where the city would have to pay those spots in order to make the pay parking and. They've now indicated that as long as there's proper signage and there's no a tripping hazard between the pavement and the right of way, that the city would be authorized and, and able to move forward with safe parking. So, I guess the first question is the location. Do we want? Does is it is it the will of council to move forward with safe parking for next year? If so, what areas? Um, one of the things that we brought up in terms of the location conversation is currently there are two areas that are unregulated. And that includes the area adjacent to the recreation center, that being 27th Avenue, 27th uh, Hartnett between 27th and 29th, and also 29th Avenue. Um, currently, there, there are no restrictions associated with parking in those in those areas. Um, also, Bridge Inlet. So our recommendation to the committee was that those be treated in some way, whether they're pay parking or they're part of the residential district. But we figured that, um, if that if those two spots are the only ones where free parking is available, then there is a potential of them being um, overrun by people looking for free parking um, on the island. So that's you know part of the conversation and the direction that we are seeking from, from the full policy setting body um, today. The other question is associated with the um, season. Is it going to be a paid parking season year round or is it going to be seasonal like we uh, manage the Front Beach municipal lots and the on-street parking? Um, as a reminder, those uh, paid parking areas at Front Beach are managed or enforced from March 1st through October 31st. So is it going to mirror that or is the will of council to make it 24, um, you know, 12, uh, 12 months out of the year pay parking? Um, also the time, um, currently nine, the residential district is enforced between um, 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. Is the intention to also enforce pay parking in those areas between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m.? The also the other thing we need some direction from council is related to the rate. Um, we had some discussions about providing a, a, a combination of um, hourly parking and daily parking, very similar to what we have on Front Beach in our municipal lots. And also there was a brief conversation about potentially offering a seasonal pass for off island folks to be able to purchase, just like we have at Front Beach. Um, we have a seasonal pass that allows people to park there. It's first come, first serve. So uh, a similar, a sim similar um, uh, arrangement like that. The committee did not, public safety did not make a recommendation to include a seasonal pass. Um, I still wanted to bring it up to the full, full group in, in the event that there's any other additional discussion and, and considerations to that. Um, so basically, I'll just restate, if you don't mind, Chair um, Councilmember Buchanan, the recommendations from public, from public safety, um, those were to implement paid parking along both sides of Palm Boulevard between 21st and 40th, the land side of Palm between 41st and 57th, and including the breach inlet parking lot, including the areas adjacent to the rec center into the residential district, meaning that, oh, I'm sorry, Hartnett between 27th and 29th, including that in the residential district, which would mean that would be treated like we treat all their residential districts. Those vehicles that have the city issued decal would be able to park. Um, there was also some conversation about making it recreational center um, only as well. So, um, and also enforcing paid parking between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. So consistent with the times where residential parking district is enforced. Uh, and also doing it seasonal between March 1st through October 1st. And for there to be a combination of hourly and daily fee similar to the existing rates at the municipal parking lot. De Desiree, may I ask a question? Um, yeah. The, there was confusion. You know, I know some of us got emails as well. 
We've never had discussion about paid parking within the residential district 27, 28th, 29th. It was a pretty toxic issue today right. um, on, on email exchanges. I don't think that any discussion we've had amongst council or you know, perhaps it did happen within a public safety committee, but it seems, um, seems that we really wouldn't want, want to go down a road. I'd like to see the rec center separated from, you know, beach park. I understand the issue. The issue there is simply it's for the rec center purposes and residents can park there. And we've always allowed uh, non-residents to come to the rec center. It has uh, ATAX money funding associated with it. But, you know, it's kind of on us to ensure that it's being used for, you know, the rec center purposes. But boy, going down a path of kiosk and... and no, and there wasn't, and Randy, there wasn't any... any okay, thanks. For coming out of public safety to make that paid parking, the, the biggest part was to signify that down 27th Avenue is open parking because we have, we have ball games. We have, we have, you know, all types of events going on around the rec center. We can't charge for parking for people to come out and play or utilize those side streets. The biggest thing was we had a lot of folks along Hartnet and those spots were getting filled up and within the, within the rec center that was being filled up in, in folks who were coming to the rec center didn't have a place to park. So we were trying to utilize that area along Hartnet as recreation use um, as well. So, but yeah, there's, the idea that kiosks were going to be put up, you have to be at paid parking along 27th or 29th Avenue was never an issue. Yeah, it's just the way this reads, you know, it, you can certainly leap to that assumption. Going it, right, it, right. I started getting those emails today as well. And it was like, I start, I had to go back and double check the agenda to figure out why I was getting these emails on based on. Same here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I'll just interject because we did actually talk about this at the rec center, uh, rec committee meeting. Um, it didn't go very far. It didn't feel right. Uh, but I did think that there was a possibility for maybe charging on the weekends to potentially cover the costs of somebody being stationed there to make sure that we protected rec center parking. But again, it didn't go very far. So I don't know if that maybe got uh, brought up in the public. <coughs> just for some explanation that we had some brief conversation about that at the rec committee meeting, but it really didn't go very far. Um, and otherwise I'll just interject that I think, uh, you know, from my perspective as the rec chair committee, um, uh, rec committee chair, we did not deliver a recommendation from our committee, but, uh, I think there would should be some protection for rec center use of all of that space and that um, would not want to see that limited to residential right. only in any of the parts of the rec center grounds. That, that's what we had indicated. Okay. Yes, my question. It, so it, we're talking about, you know, um, and, and Mr. Chair, do we want to go to paid parking? This is a question that you're really posing to council, and then you would take it back to um, public well, here's, safety. Correct, and here's and here's the thing: is we've this is something that we've been working on for the last year. And I met Desiree, and I met with uh, DOT earlier this year, pre-COVID, about you know trying to move forward with paid parking. As as you can tell now, if, if you drive down along along sections of Palm Boulevard where there's areas you you cannot park right now because of the ruts, um, because of the just, I don't want to call it mismanagement, but it's, you know, we have to wait on SCDOT to come in and maintain those roads. And we necessarily can't come in and fill it. We can't maintain it. We can't put backfill because we have to go through a permitting process. Um, we're not even, you know, we, we just can't do it. If we were to take over those roads and have a revenue source do for do it, we'd actually have a viable parking program along the ocean side of Palm Boulevard, where we can go through and do, you know, infrastructure improvements and, uh, and have have parking. But then we go back through it and we look at all the other other programs that we the costs that are allowed or that are that are that the city pays for 
well, we spend between just to implement parking on the island, we're, you know, the city tax dollars, we're half a million dollars in to provide parking. But, and that still doesn't include garbage. We go from three times a week to Desiree, seven times, seven times a week, garbage pickup. And then we have the number of emergency calls. We have the number of police calls. We have, you know, just our public works going, driving up and down the beach every day, picking up the debris and tents and chairs and garbage. So there, I mean, it's easily 700, Fifty thousand dollars a year or more that the city pays I mean, in city taxes. Um, <coughs> Brian, not to disturb you. I mean, we totally agree with everything you're saying. You know, um, I'm just trying to make sure you have affirmation that from council to go forward with this. That's what you're right. looking for. And that absolutely. And now I'm just trying to give some backstory on it and why why we've been moving forward on this for the past year, trying to you know supplement some of this. Um, and that's why we went through and discussed. So now what we're looking for is, as Desiree said, those zones that we're looking for, no matter what we do, we weren't planning on implementing anything like this until next beach season. Um, so whatever happens on Palm Boulevard in the future happens in Palm Boulevard in the future. But for right now, um, we're just looking for um, some guidance from council to whether or not we wanna have it along Palm Boulevard, have it at Breach Inlet um, and have it so it, uh, the other um, public access. It, right, just for point of clarity, this conversation goes way beyond just a year. It, it was only oh, since yeah. the DOT has allowed us not to physically delineate parking spaces that we've been able to, to have the conversation within the last year. Right. No, absolutely. And it goes all the way back to when they really made us go back from perpendicular parking to parallel parking. Right. And it goes back that far. And, you know, we're trying in that... That in itself eliminated a number of parking spots along Palm Boulevard. So it would just, DOT has been r really good at working with the city recently and allowing us to kind of meet the demands of the growing population of the Tri-County area and to meet the demands of the, um, the, the taxation on, on, on us, on the city, um, and the, what it takes for us to manage beach parking. Well, and just I wanted to add something, Mayor, to respond to your earlier question. During the several budget workshops that we had in preparation of the FY21 uh, budget that we have right now, we were asked to put a plan together that would implement pay parking for next season. And in the slide and the presentation that you all have in your package, there's a timeline. And in order for us to do it in time, we, we need to get some direction no later than August of what that plan looks like so that we can go ahead and engage any um, assi extra assistance and mid documentation to SCDOT, purchase any equipment that we need to. As you all know, the FY21 budget includes funds for license plate readers that would facilitate the police department and force and pay parking on, on the, these, these areas. Um, it would be through a pay by app. So I, I know that there was some comments or conversation about parking kiosk and the idea would be to have a pay by app only in these, you know, these particular areas. There are still kiosks down, down at Front Beach. So if anybody doesn't have a smartphone, they would still be able to um, pay for park and, and ha have access to the beach. So that's why it's, it's here. It was brought up to public safety because we need to start moving along and getting some of these decisions um, this, you know, decided upon so that we have the direction and uh, be able to move forward to implement. It, 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 Dr. It, it, I may have one comment, please. One more. At, yeah. at the same time that we have these conversations, can we begin to engage with some of the other local communities or at least reach out? Uh, the, the issue is the number of cars and parking. It's not trying to restrict and limit people's access to the beach. We have, a, we, we have an automobile problem. We don't have the room to park as many as wish to come here. And I would hope that Mount Pleasant of all cities would actively engage with us and begin some proactive moves to provide some transportation from off island. Council member um, Bell, um, the three beach communities, you know, we are the, the brunt of the Tri-County's unbridled growth over the last few decades. <laughs> and our beaches are not growing any further. And so we are all looking actively at going forward, you know, with some sort of increased 
beach parking management plans. Um, so we are in communication with one another. More so inland, Mayor. And, and Desiree, with this, because you brought up the idea of a parking pass and the idea of somebody coming to City Hall or the Police Department and trying to buy an annual parking pass for this would be, I can, I can only imagine the logistics behind it. But I believe with, with the app process, I think we can be able to go through and um, look at perhaps somebody being able to buy a, an annual pass or annual um, permit to park at the beach at a discounted rate as well if they come out every day or whatever. Yeah, we don't have a whole lot of details on that, but we did reach out to the app company and they said that it may be, it may be possible. So we'll definitely explore that and see what that looks like. Okay, Mr. Chair, back to you. I think it's right this oh. one, Susan Smith. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to chime in in support of trying to find ways, um, since we're going from free to paid, in uh, across the island, finding ways to make it still accessible and not cost prohibitive, especially for our neighboring communities who the beach is a regular part of their, you know, visiting, they're, they're frequently here to exercise and that kind of thing. So if, um, through passes, a seasonal pass, which sounds like it could be very doable on an app and then um, consideration of hourly rates, um, especially in those street areas that we're adding in, I think can really go a long ways um, in terms of goodwill and uh, encouraging people to be able to, to use the beach without paying a high cost, especially if they're just visiting here for an hour or two. Okay. Desiree, do you, do you need a motion or a vote from us? I see John, Council Member Moy. Right. I'll, I'll try to be brief because I, I will largely echo Councilmember Bell and Council Member Smith that um, I think we need to um, really, this is now, we really have a pretty shortened timeline, but this is the time for us to engage with the broader Charleston community, the Tri-County area. Um, and we're trying to solve a problem um, with the, the beach communities um, but largely it's impacting folks that don't live here. Uh, I know it's impacting our residents, of course, as well, but the, the things that we're implementing are, are impacting the broader community because they obviously want access to the beach and we want there to be responsible, accountable access to the beach. That's what I think all residents can agree to that. That's what we want. The explosive growth makes, makes it really challenging. And I think that if we invite them into helping us solve that, there's there's likely to be better solutions and better collaboration, and frankly, um, less animosity as we as we work together as a community. And you know, it's easy to say that it's much harder to execute and do it, but um, you know, we at least need to provide an, an opportunity for the leaders that are operating in Mount Pleasant and in North Charleston and in Dirk Berkeley and Dorchester counties um, to express to them this is what we're dealing this is these are the goals we have very good goals set out in this in this document we want their their citizens and their residents to have access to the beach um, but we need to do it in a way that's responsible and maintains um, the quality the rights of way all of the things that councilman recan mentioned like we have to pay for a lot of stuff um, and it the, the cost and, and continue to increase and so I think if we can involve some of the greater community in, in helping us come up with solutions, that, that that's only positive. I say that in the context of, of this paid parking because the last thing that, that I personally want is for people to not be able to go to the beach because it's cost prohibitive. Um, and uh, that's you know, uh, not necessarily an, an action item yet. I spoke to Desiree about this earlier. And so I don't know. Desiree, if you have any initial thoughts, I know I'm putting you on the spot. And I, you've gotten, had no time to think about it. So there, um, if, it, if it's something you want to take into consideration um, between now and the next August meeting, um, I think that's more than reasonable. We can do that. Yeah. Yeah, and one quick, you know, um, if when you look at a stadium, a football stadium at the USC or College Charleston basketball stadium, it only holds so many people. And that's where we're at with Vile Palm, Solon's Island, Folly Beach. We only hold so many people. And it's become a public safety issue going down Palm Boulevard 
when a storm comes up in the afternoon and everybody's trying to find that shortcut that we all know does not exist on our bombs and everybody's going through the neighborhoods and some child is going to get hit and we're going to say why didn't we do something about this before that's what we're trying to achieve and ryan you know your my hat's off to you let's let's get it done All right. Um, okay. Um, so one question, can I ask? Yes, go ahead. Okay. All right. So there's, it doesn't seem like there's, um, I don't think that the intention was to take any action tonight. Um, no. discussion, and I know that by August, according to our timeline, we should be finalizing the plan, but it sounds to me that there's consensus about staff at least moving forward in that direction with the goal of implementing paid parking. Um, for next season? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Some of the details will just refine by next month. Check right. hands. Yes. Hey, <clears throat> just making sure. <laughs> um, old, old, moving on under old business, we had an update on our public safety building. I'm not sure if any of you, if you've had the opportunity to go through and walk through it, but I would encourage you to do so. It's getting getting super close. Um, the, they're really wrapping up around the front of the building. They are putting the new, um, the, the roof on. It's, it really is pulling together. Um, Desert, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I saw them today um, cutting up the concrete up front, up front of the building. I don't know if you want to add anything to this. Are we good? I'm sorry, my, my computer froze. You're fine, okay. We're, we're, we'll, Right now, we're about 80% done with the, you know, done with the new siding and paint, and everything's moving forward. And we have, you know, we're still looking at a November end date. So, yeah, that yep. is correct. So, it under, looks yeah, it looks, yeah, it looks good. But I'm gonna keep moving on. And we had discussion of existing rules for dogs on the beach, in consideration of recommendation from the police department. Chief Cornett indicated that he was increasing patrols, um, increasing education, and uh, the number of um, about regarding dog bites and. Some of the instances that have happened when dogs were permitted off leash, um, we're trying to increase patrols, increasing education on um, in that area for uh, um, dogs off leash. Under fire department, Chief Graham gave her report and reported that there were 120 calls for service, including 31 beach and water related calls in June. Um, Police department, Chief Cornette issued, stated there were about 1,630 calls for the service in June. 1,630 parking tickets were issued, 102, 102 incident reports were written along with five coyote sightings. And we've noticed an increase in coyote sightings recently. And we're gonna put that on our agenda for our next public safety meeting to discuss it. Um, under miscellaneous business, we had um, it was just discussion of the next public safety meeting, which would be Monday, August 3rd at 9 a.m. Great report, any questions? Hearing none, moving on to Public Works. Thank you, Mayor. We had a meeting on Wednesday, July 1st, 8 a.m. All were present, uh, met via Zoom, of course. Uh, first item was we had department reports from Donnie and Robert, just continued good work on the day-to-day -day blocking and tackling that goes on with that group, as well as you know some uh, effort around uh, drainage and such around the island. Uh, we had an update on phase three drainage project and the small internal projects, which we've touched on already and from the ways and means. <clears throat> we discussed the outsourcing of household garbage collection services. Donnie, Desiree, Debbie had done a lot of data collection on that, and we were, there's still some more to do and some analysis there. Again, just think it's a good fiduciary duty of us to make sure we're doing the right thing for our residents from a cost and servicing standpoint. Um, discussion of timeline to reinstate plastic ban on IOP businesses. You'll recall that um, is extended or it goes through August 24th. Um, so some conversation, we'll continue that conversation next month at our committee meeting and have a recommendation for council um, next month around that. Discussion of drainage impacts of new construction and lot elevation on neighboring properties. Our next meeting is Thursday, August 6th at 8 a.m. That's it, Mayor. That's a great report. Thank you. You get the award tonight so far. Moving on, recreation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to hit a couple of points and then uh, because we are in an evolving situation with the rec center and COVID, um, 
I'm going to warn our uh, rec center director that I'll be handing it off to her to give the most recent information. Um, but we did discuss uh, surfing lessons. Um, we've made progress on that towards hopefully starting at the beginning of September, maybe sooner, I hope, um, because children will be back in school. We are looking at hosting some lessons from 4.30 to 6.30 and maybe a surfing class on Saturday. And um, if, if there's anything more to report on that, I'll let Norma Jean mention that when she gets her turn. Um, otherwise, we're they're moving forward with uh, classes and activities for the fall, potentially trying to add in more virtual classes um, or ones that could go back and forth if needed from in-person to virtual, uh, depending on what our situation is with COVID. And um, we did talk about the beach parking issue at the rec center. Um, and otherwise, as far as, uh, as some highlights, we have had some camps. Um, I think we've already discussed that we had uh, some issues with um, Camp Summershine early on, uh, but I believe they were able to finish out the rest of the season once um, we had a counselor that tested positive, but we followed guidelines from MUSC, took a pause, and then went, went back when we felt safe um, to finish out camp. Um, I will, uh, well, I will say the Isle of Palms connector run was, or not connector run, but the beach run was changed to a virtual run. I'll hand this off now to Norma Jean to update us on other upcoming events. Okay. Um, well, just briefly, we have made a little bit of progress with our surfing lessons. We've discussed the schedule and of course it's fluid depending on the school system. If, if, the, um, if our children don't go to school the first of September, then we talked about having classes four to 6.30 or, but if they don't go to school, then we'll back that up and have classes during the day. Um, right now we're looking at having classes on Monday and Wednesday for one age group, Tuesdays and Thursdays for another age group, have uh, lessons on Saturdays and also on Sundays. So we're, we've kind of got a tentative schedule there. I'd love to start the end of August, but we're still waiting um, to make sure that everyone has their certification. Um, like I stated last month, uh, North Charleston will conduct the classes for us, but they're monitoring the numbers with COVID and they don't feel comfortable doing those lessons yet. And it, it's not an open to public um, lifeguarding certification, but it's something that they're going to do for, for us. So I feel good about where we're going with the surfing. Um, like I said, I hope we can start the end of August. If not, we will start in September. Our summer camp's going great. We had that little hiccup. Um, fortunately, only that one person tested positive. Everyone else was, was tested. No one else tested positive. We started camp back. Everything's running smooth. We have one more week to get through Camp Summershine. The beach parking, we put signs out that said rec center parking only or rec center activity parking only between 27th and Hartnett, uh, 27th and 29th and Hartnett. And I don't think anybody's abused that. Um, I think they've used 27th some. We also have a sign at 28th. And so we haven't had any um, problems with, with beach parking here lately. Uh, and um, the beach run was a virtual run. It didn't go as well as we thought it would, but um, some folks did, did participate. So we're mailing their t-shirts and their medals to them. Any questions, I'll try to answer them. Next question. Norma Jean, real quick. Yes. I love surf camp being fluid. Perfect analogy. <laughs> Pardon the pun, right? Yes. <laughs> and if not, I asked. Susan, so when's your report? Uh, yes, we'll have our next meeting will be um, the first Monday in August, August 3rd at 5 p.m. Thank you so much. Uh, personnel did not have a meeting in July. Uh, real property committee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The real property meeting uh, committee met 1 p.m. Thursday, Tuesday, July 14th. Uh, myself and Councilmember Bell were present. 
<clears throat> we had citizens comments. We had an update on the Marina dock pruning re rehabilitation project. The administrator stated that part of the RFP for the project was it um, advertised on July 10th, 2020, and the deadlines for the questions was August 21st. The deadlines for bid is September 4th. Hopefully we'll be up, <clears throat> up and moving um, and having new docks in by next spring. Um, we had an update on the Marina lease proposal, which we talked about and we'll talk about in a little bit. We update on the public safety building, which we talked about in public safety. And, um, we did have an update on the <clears throat> Greenbelt proposal application for the ADA compliant beach walkover and observation deck at 42nd Avenue. We need to keep changing that because it's not an observation deck. It's a place where folks can set up when, it, because it's an ADA compliant um, pathway that folks can, um, if they're walking up there, they can stand up at the side, let other people pass. It's not that they're gonna be standing out there and having a picnic and whatever. It's just a place where they can, other folks can pass. But that is still something that we're um, working on. We had consideration of the change order uh, from AETM um, for the dock rehabilitation project, which was already voted on. And then we had, that was the end of our meeting. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, August 5th at five. That's a great report. Any questions? I just wanted to add a couple of things, Mayor, if I may. Of course you may. <laughs> well, we had the pre-bid meeting for the Marina Dock Rehabilitation Project um, this morning, and it went very well. Just wanted to give you all an update on that. We're having a lot of, um, interest from very reputable farms that so were um we did instruct them to sharpen their their pencils before they submit a a bid uh, so we're very excited about that um, project being able to start by end of september the other thing i wanted to um, let you all know is that we have um scheduled a zoom meeting a virtual meeting with the residents of 42nd avenue some of them expressed some questions and concerns about the proposed uh, beach walkover. So we'll be having that tomorrow. And we've been trying to sh spread the word and make sure that they um, uh, spread the Zoom link amongst themselves. And um, we're excited to be able to explain the project and um, the history of that project and be able to address any questions and concerns and um, really have them involved in the, in the whole process. And um, also wanted to inform you all that last week, Charleston County Council did approve the allocation of funds towards that project. As you all know, those we have Greenbelt funds that are allocated to the city. Because we're a beach community, we have a little bit more flexibility on where we use them. And beach walkovers and public access to the community is an eligible activity. So um, we got that done. That doesn't mean that the project is ready to go. Um, we certainly want to have the community and particularly the residents, residents adjacent to that um, involved. Um, so that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Desiree. All right, moving along here. I promise everybody. Reports from city officers, boards, and commissions, accommodations, tax advisory committee, no meeting. Board of zoning appeals, minutes are attached. Uh, planning commission, minutes are attached. Number six, reports of special or joint committees, none. Number seven, petitions received, referred, disposed of, none. Bills already in possession. We've got four two of which we're gonna probably have to, we, we not probably have to, we have to defer until we have public comments before the next meeting. The first one of course was um, ordinance 20-20-04 in order to reduce the maximum occupancy at a short-term rental to twice the maximum overnight occupancy, not to exceed 40 people. Desiree, is that correct in saying that until we have the public? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. We'll we'll have to schedule a public hearing for for that one in 2020-07, um, yeah. and we'll do that for office. If there are any questions, then certainly we can address them now or address them um, before second reading the following month. Well, um, this, we'll come back to 2020-07 so people will know what we're talking about. So, uh, ordinance 2020-05. Uh, I want us to add conditions for the suspension of a rental business license requiring the owner's representative to be physically on site within one hour receiving a complaint and condition for the advertisement of rentals. So do I hear a motion? Motion. Second. Uh, and we heard a second. Discussion. This has been just 
heavily discussed with our planning commission and we appreciate all the work they put into it. This is try to put our rentals under better and quieter controls. Any other, dis yes sir, Councilman Moy. Uh, just to add on to that, it's it was in discussion from the planning commission as well as members of the, the short-term rental community, including property managers and, and property owners. Very good, anybody else? Okay, all those in favor, signify, let's do roll call. Councilmember Bell. Aye. Councilmember Streetman. Aye. Councilmember Popson. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Councilmember Buchanan. Aye. Councilmember Ward. Aye. Councilmember Moy. Aye. Councilmember Pounds. Aye. Mayor Carroll. Aye. All in favor? Thank you very much. Moving on, ordinance 2020-06, an ordinance to include the use of consent agendas. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. And we've discussed this at great length. Do we need to discuss it any further? <coughs> Hearing none, I think it's time for a roll call. Councilmember Bell. Aye. Councilmember Streetman. Aye. Councilmember Popson. <coughs> Aye. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Councilmember Buchanan. Aye. Councilmember Ward. Aye. Councilmember Moy. Aye. Councilmember Pounds. Aye. Mayor Carroll. Aye. All in favor? Thank you very much. Okay, next one we're gonna defer, but just to go over it real quick so y'all can think about it. Ordinance 2020-07, an ordinance to correct the lot coverage limit reduction from 40% to 35% and to 30% for properties on septic tank. This is a house cleaning problem where we left off the 30%. So again, this is something that we're gonna to have to come back to, but again, this is um, next month's order of business where we have a public hearing. Any questions on this? Hearing none, moving on. Introduction of new bills, resolutions, Proclamation, Ordinance 2020-08, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of a $16 million water and sewer system revenue bond for the decommissioning and relocation of the Wild Dunes wastewater treatment plant. Do I hear a motion? And this is for first reading and no um, only. So move, Mayor. Second. Second. Okay. Again, since there's no discussion on this, Desiree. Um, all those in favor? Is that correct, Desiree? We don't have to discuss this one. We wait till the next reading. We could, you all could have a motion to discuss. And if there's any questions about the, the actual bond ordinance, we have um, Mr. Youngblood um, with us still and Chris Jordan. Uh, so if we want to take advantage of that, um, I don't. Advantage. Yeah, I don't have any additional questions. Um, we've worked with Chris and, and Phil on this. Um, for a couple months now, um, but if anybody else does, I think if since we have they, a, they've sat here all night long and they need to have some time to kind of fill us in. I think we're all ready to go forward, but at the same time, they have endured a long night with us, <laughs> Mr. Youngblood. I'll just I'll oh. just say thank you both for all your hard work and to the city staff for putting this all together. Um, Appreciate it. Yeah, we would definitely like to thank, thank council and, and Desiree and, and Philip, especially. We've had a lot of meetings and um, uh, everybody across the street has been really helpful. And uh, we look forward to working a lot better with y'all in the future for sure. Bill, do you have anything you want to add to? Um... Bill, I think you're muted. Um, Sean, do you want to? Can we maybe unmute? I got yeah. it. I think so. There we go. Yeah. Uh, Mayor, I think I'd speak only if it would improve the silence at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got our vote right there. Okay. Well, one one thing, one thing, Bill, that I, I think Dana pointed out to me while I was fumbling through my um, presentation for the second time. He said that I misspoke and said that it would take three minutes to approve the bond, uh, get the bonds closed. So it's more, it's three months. Uh, Kelly, I, know we Bill can, I know Bill can work miracles, but I don't think you can go that quick. Okay. So. Back to the uh, roll call. 
Absolutely. Councilmember Bell? Aye. Councilmember Streetman? Aye. Councilmember Popson? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Councilmember Ward? Aye. Councilmember Moy? Aye. Councilmember Pounds? Aye. Councilmember Buchanan? Councilmember Buchanan? Aye. Thank you. Mayor Carroll? Aye. All in favor? Thank you very much. Um, let's see, miscellaneous business. Consideration of a memorandum of understanding between the Isle Palms and the Isle Palms Water and Sewer Company. We've been working with this for over a year. And Desiree, I'll let you kind of explain where we're at and where we're going. Yes, I'll, we have Douglas here and I've asked him to be available to provide an update um, to you all on the planning commission's meeting, special meeting that they had yesterday where they considered the version of the MOU that was approved by the Water and Sewer Commission recently, and also discussed some potential changes and amendments that will be, I believe, discussed by the Planning Commission at their follow-up meeting, and Council should expect a final document for ratification um, in August. Douglas, do you wanna kind of walk us through what, what the MOU includes, a little bit of background on the progress that we've made with the MOU and also the potential change. Yes, I'd be happy to. The um, As Desiree mentioned, the Planning Commission met yesterday afternoon, reviewed it, and felt like the document was still generally a good document, even though it's now uh, about two years old. Uh, but it's very uh, generic in nature and speaks to things uh, about, about being cooperative, about being uh, sharing information um, and improving communications going forward. So they didn't see any uh, glaring issues with the MOU as it stands. They did, uh, there was a, a handful of what I would call editorial changes that they wanted to make. Uh, they wanted to reference that there has been a master plan completed by Thomas and Hutton. Uh, there was also mention of a funding source in the MOU, which they wanted to delete that. I think that was more, um, I think that was intended to reference grants that were potentially available. Uh, they also wanted for the MOU to include a basically a, a reporting requirement on their construction progress as they move forward. And then I, get, I think the, the most meaningful uh, change that they wanna make is to have a follow up document, basically an additional MOU that gets into more specifics uh, and detail and really provide a roadmap for how an expansion could and, and should happen. So they're going to recommend, I think, that you will adopt the current MOU with some minor edits with the understanding that a more detailed roadmap would come sometime in the next year uh, following, following the bond, obviously. And and the current process that we're under. Questions? I do have one or two questions actually, Douglas and Bill and Chris and, and um, you know, it's like during the hurricane season, we have our OPCOM meetings and I would love to see water and sewer part of our OPCOM discussions so we know what's going on. We actually have Louise Island come over and join us and I'd also kind of like to see us to have a city council member go to the Water and Sewer Commission meetings on a regular basis and vice versa, have one of them come to our council members. So we are working very closely together. That's not now, but this is something down the road. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Is that, yes, council member Popson. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, just to your point, um, Mount Pleasant, one of the board members is a council person. So maybe we could uh, eventually get to uh, going down that road. There you go. Anyone else? Go yes, I, just, I wanted to add that just from the staff's perspective, the um, relationship, the, the improvement of the relationship between um, the Water and Sewer Commission and the city has uh, really improved greatly. And I, I can't say, you know, nicer things about Chris and their team, their uh, willingness to work with us and Douglas, I know that it's been a long, a long process and I'm just excited to see what, 
comes out of that relationship and also the work that planning commission has set themselves up to 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 complete and really look at it so it's been a labor of love totally agree okay desiree is there anything we need to do on that beyond there no sir because final um, that includes the minor edits that Douglas sort of um, spelled out, and I think we should be ready to go by August, right, Douglas? Will do you think will there be a recommendation from planning to? Um, yes. Approve? Okay. Yes, there will be uh, a recommendation on this initial MOU in August, uh, and there will be the expectation that a more detailed roadmap would be coming to you sometime in, within, I would say, a year. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that covers this uh, memorandum of understanding. Um, and I think it's time to move on. Um, gentlemen, thank you all for coming to our meeting tonight. And uh, yeah, thank you enough. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Take care. All. Yeah, thank you all. We'll Take care. Thank you. Okay. okay. Number 11, check your second of this meeting. No. No. Discussion. We're going to end the session. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Discussion of Marina input session is under the MOU. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that totally right there in the sentence. Discussion of Marina input session. Um, we have a slideshow put on, I think, for Ron Hanna, who has put, worked a lot of hours on this. In fact, both Desiree and Ron worked many hours this afternoon on this. Um, so. <laughs> Let's let y'all kind of bring us up to date on what we had back in our um, marina input session. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, so I want to go ahead and, and say that this has been a huge effort on behalf of the entire city government. We've had people across all departments who were involved in collecting the data and uh, working at the workshop and, and things like that. So. Um, thank you to everybody who participated, all the, the citizens and community members, as well as the, uh, the city employees who participated in, in making sure that we were able to, to get this information. So you can see the first slide there, uh, looking at the marina as it stands now. Uh, and basically, we wanted to just have a visioning session uh, with the community. And we did that across three channels. So if uh, you were able to um, make it to the rec center. We had an in-person charrette kind of event, uh, very similar to what a lot of planning and um, strategic planning and urban planning companies do for uh, sort of in-person discussions with community groups and, and being forward looking. We also had an online forum uh, which was another way that people could participate. And if you were at the meeting, but were not able to get into the room due to fire code, we also handed out a paper survey for people to fill out. Now, all three channels uh, had the same questions and they were all weighted exactly the same. So everybody's participation was, was valued. Um, city council sought to provide multiple opportunities for the community to provide feedback for their individual visions. Uh, about the marina and where we want to go from here. So the online forum was the first thing that was made available and it was made available on January 3rd, 2020 before everything, uh, <laughs> COVID and whatnot. So, and that was available through February 24, 21st, 2020 for a total of 191 entries. 76% um, of those people who participated in the online forum were full-time residents. That's a large majority. 12% of those were uh, part-time residents with 7% being non-resident property own owners and 5% of them being visitors. The community workshop was held on January 30th in 2020, obviously, uh, with a total of 94 people participating. And that was, again, just due to uh, fire code. 90% of the people who participated were full-time residents. That's an overwhelming majority of the people. I believe we had one individual there who was a visitor. Everybody else was, was a resident. Uh, and so 40 of the people who identified as full-time residents filled out a paper form uh, during the workshop because they were not able to get into the room. So the first question that we asked is what amenities, if any, should the marina start offering? Now, 
we originally did this by in the workshop by setting up tables where individuals could sit around and have a discussion with a city employee who was a facilitator. The goal there being that we could kind of keep the discussion on track and make sure that everybody was providing quality input and, and that input was recorded accurately. Uh, at the end of the marina session, we handed out some red or green dots to people for them to place next to ideas that they liked about what we should start, continue, or stop offering at the marina. Uh, I think you, as you can see here, the overwhelming response, the far and away lead is we wanted, our residents wanted a restaurant, bar, or dining option uh, down there at the marina. And this was around the time that uh, the restaurant that was there was no longer there. And so we were looking at, um, you know, the, the process that we're coming to the end of, uh, part of that was, was coming out of this. So we also had a public dock, a dedicated kayak and stand up paddleboard launch uh, being a, a much desired item from our residents. And then finally green space. So those are the top three takeaways from this that people wanted to get and that we got out of the, uh, the data. Um, I mentioned the dots earlier. Uh, we did have numerous written reports of individuals who were collecting dots off of the tables and then placing additional dots other than the three that were handed to them by the facilitators on the charts. So the first chart you'll see here contains all of the information um, from all three channels. So online, in person, with the dots, and the, the paper forms. The next slide is the same information, right? So it's the same question, it's the same data from the online form, it's the same data from the, uh, the paper forms, but it does not include the dots. So the goal there being to um, you know, utilize standard methods for analyzing qualitative data to make sure that, that we were getting accurate descriptions of what, uh, what our community was saying. So again, you can see those, those same three top responses. So the next spot uh, was what, or the next question was what amenities of any sh should the marina continue to offer or expand it upon? And again, far and away here, we see the restaurant and bar is, is the main thing that people really, really wanted. Um, then again, did the same thing here. You can see both of these, uh, doesn't really change things much there. Um, for the, the top three items. Uh, resident parking slips and boat launch are, are another thing that we saw a lot of comments about. Uh, and that should be taken into account when examining these results. So lastly, we looked at what amenities, if any, should the marina stop offering? Well, I think you can see just from the, the bar chart there that primarily nothing is what people wanted to stop. You know, uh, our residents like the marina the way that it is, uh, but want to add some some more options to it. So if you look at some of the, the statements that we received from uh, residents in words from the online poll, uh, you'll see under start, you know, they were looking for additional food service and entertainment. Um, we would love to see a spot where we could relax and sit with our friends and family, tables and benches on the water, paddleboard and kayak storage and for residents, possibly a boat launch. Uh, Items about dedicated paddle sports launch ramp, separate make ready area, green space. Con conservation begins with awareness and we need to get our youth out into nature was a statement that uh, we saw on there. And, you know, it's just a, a lot of uh, input from the community geared at continuing to get a restaurant in there, also providing some green space where people can kind of relax around the water and providing public access to the water. So like docks for fishing, that kind of thing. Um, and that is basically the presentation. Uh, the, the stops also included information about, um, you know, in, encouraging residential uses uh, and stopping long-term unfavorable leases, which again, has been part of this restaurant discussion. So any questions? Let's go to full screen, thank you. All right, questions. Seeing none. So, Ron, I'll ask you a question. Uh, Council Member Popson. Ron, can you go back to question uh, number two? 
What amenities, if any, should the marina continue to offer expand upon? Uh, yes, I can. Hang on just a second. I just got to pull that back up. Damn, he's good. <laughs> Should have said that. <laughs> All right. So, can you guys see that? It's back? Yes. Cool. All right. So, question number two, right there. Okay. So, so this, this slide, I, and I just, I just want to, you know, make some sense of it, but this slide has the restaurant bar totally way ahead, right? And it has tidal wave second um, with somewhere around 105 boats. And then how come this slide is different? Tom, can you help me with the difference? Sorry. Yeah, so, so again, um, both of these slides are the same data from the online poll and from the paper survey. This particular slide does include the dots uh, that were placed on the um, papers that were recorded. On the next slide, we removed the dots due to the numerous written concerns that were received by the city about individuals placing dots next to things that you know were retrieved from the table um, without the facilitator handing them out. And so that's, that's the reason that you see the difference there is, is the removal of those dots. Gotcha. If I will, if I may, I, I guess I would just want to add to that. Um, you know, obviously we we had employees can't be facilitators in each of the tables, um, and we couldn't necessarily control what happened um, in the room and whether people were, you know, taking dots or not taking dots. Just I think when when we discussed the concerns that were expressed to us by some of the uh, participants of the workshop, we decided to be as transparent as possible and just showing you all the results if you counted the dots versus not counting the dots um, and let each council member or each community, you know, people from the community to weigh in the results, whether you, know, you think that the dots should be counted or whether the dots should not be counted. Um, I think that the overall, response was overwhelming and doesn't necessarily change the results, whether you count the dots or not count the dots. Um, the differences are very m minimal, um, if you will. Um, the, the, the overwhelming majority of people who responded and participated in providing input um, really focused on what the current marina doesn't have and they would like to see. And I don't think it's anything new from what the city has heard in the past. I mean, it's, it's very consistent to the input that we received as part of the referendum process, you may all recall. Um, how long ago was that? Five years, six, four years? Um, so, it's, you know, very similar um, when it comes to, you know, really wanting to have a restaurant there and also the conversation about the public dock and green space. That's why the referendum plan that was presented to the community included a public dock in that area. So um, I guess it just continues to echo that. But again, you all have the information and um, we'll be happy to answer any additional questions. Questions? Council Member Ward. Um, unless I'm reading it wrong, it looked like there was a lot of people that wanted to continue to have a uh, tidal wave. Is that correct? That's correct. You are not reading the data incorrectly there. And just to make sure also, we separated the categories. So those who indicated tidal wave were included in one separate category. And those who only indicated motorized water sports or jet skiing or parasailing or any other type of motorized water sports were in a different category. Um, we didn't lump those two together. More questions? This is a huge decision, ladies and gentlemen. So please have questions. If you've got them, this is the time to put them out there. Uh, so, so, I don't think we have any, I don't think there's any action. Um, right. Right. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Council Member Street. Yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, I, uh, I guess I'm repeating what Desiree just, just, just said. I mean, where do we go from here? I mean, 
we've got we've got this presentation, but there's still I think unanswered questions here. I think we need to dig into it a little more. I don't know. Well, we, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the next steps? So, Mr. Mayor, if I might, <clears throat> go ahead, sir. And, and this guy, I mean, this whole thing got delayed a lot of time just because of COVID and, and the numbers and everything. But um, we were able to, we, we discussed this in real property and we wanted, we wanted to get in front of the committee, you know, in, rest, in front of the rest of council to get, to show them the numbers, show them what's going on, show them what the people are wanting and whether, you know, you know, whether it's, like I said, the number one thing they really want is a restaurant down there. And that's what we're working on right now. You know, and, and then folks do want, they want water sports. They want a dock. They want, so we have to take that, um, take that information that we have now and then move forward with it. And we, we don't have much more time. Right. So like I said, I don't think there's an action. There's not an action item on this tonight. It was just a, um, just basically move forward, putting all the information out there, but everybody has to disseminate this information and we have to come to an agreement on what needs to be done. I think the primary thing is to move forward with the restaurant. That's, and, that's, and, and you know, that's the biggest thing. That's the number one thing that came out of this. And the thing we need to look forward is what are we going to do with the public dock, you know, and the tidal wave dock and what are we going to move in, in, in the rest of that area? So what amenities do people want to keep? What amenities and all the information's in there. Now we just need to, you know, pull it all out and um, make a decision on what needs to be done. Council Member Moy. Yeah, um, uh, maybe uh, Council Member Buchanan, are you suggesting that um, we need to make a decision as in the Real Property Committee is gonna to put together recommendations for Council or I guess uh, I'm unclear, I, and I'm just looking for clarification because and I'll, I'll state my, my takeaway is that there's four very, to me, seemingly obvious things. The restaurant, the um, green space, public dock, and tidal wave. Those are the, the four things that we want. We've got the restaurant more or less, and it's, it's moving along, so I won't money the water there. But the other three things, it, I think the, the question for council, um, and if, if real property wants to take a swing at how do we accomplish those things, by all means. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out if that's what you're suggesting, but I think that's that's what our task is how do we how do we get all of those things to harmoniously exist on right. our five acres? And, and a real, definitely the, the three of us who are pro real property can take that up and m make a decision. But I think, I mean, this, and this whole thing is a, you know, this is a, it's a council decision. Right. And, um, and we need to move forward. With, I mean, we need to make something, I mean, I don't have a problem taking it back to real, uh, real property and discussing it and, making an, and you know making some type of uh, right. recommendation but i think in it this is this is you know that, that's only three of nine and um this is i mean this is like you said is it's going to incorporate you know decisions that can be made forward for you know, for some time and um whether we have a group discussion that or not council member pounds i think you're next and then council member smith and then council member bell and i could be wrong in that motion direction i'll, but I'll be quick that yeah, I'll be quick, Mayor. I was going to agree with John. I think I would love to see this go back to real property and come back with some recommendation to council and then let us continue to vet the options. And I'm, and Ryan, I'm not sure what the urgency is around making a decision on something other than the restaurant, but yeah. I, 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 I agree with John. I think next step is let real property take this down a path and come back with a recommendation. Thank you. We can do that. We can definitely do that. Council Member Smith. I was just wondering if the timeline would allow us to discuss this with our strategic planning in the fall. Um, Desiree, I'll let you answer that one. I mean, sure. I mean, I guess that the strategic planning process will certainly include a, a, a big component on in the initiative related to the IOP Marina. Um, you know, we can certainly incorporate that in those discussions if that's the will of council. Okay, Council Member Bell. Yeah, I'm just going to remind everybody going back almost, well, two and a half years, we said until we knew what we required in terms of that property, which the limited control that we have for a restaurant, we couldn't move forward with any other decision. I think, frankly, um, everybody wants everything right now. There's not enough geography to have everything. And one of the things, when you look at Tidal Wave, and I've said it, I'll say it a fifth time. 
if we were to continue with that type of water sport, it should be tidal wave, right? The question is, at that size, at that scale, can you have a restaurant? Can you have that? And I'll remind everybody, there was never a tidal wave question on the survey. It was a water sports question. And we'll answer that as we move forward with the restaurant as to what we're doing. But I think something that, that all of us need to consider, um, we don't need to be in the real estate business. Brian Berrigan is in the real estate business. And an option is for Brian to decide what he can fit and what best serves the community down there as a commercial entity. At the same time, we still get to look at going forward with what the public has asked for, which is a public dock and green space. It's not exclusive, uh, you know, to say that Tidal Wave can't be there. But, you know, we, we continue to wrestle, and we're now in the third year of me being on Real Property Committee with too many commercial businesses and too little control of the city. So, uh, Ryan, I personally don't think there's purpose in going back to the Real Property Committee. We're going to come to the same conclusions we've had for the last several years. It's a full council discussion to prioritize what the community wants. Anyone else? I'm going to take one stat and then I'm done. Um, to piggyback on Council Member Bell, we've got 5.12 acres down there. Um, we had four leases down there, um, two of which were just wide open, do whatever you want, have as many businesses as you want. And now that two leases have come open, we're finding that we have issues with parking. We knew we had parking problems before, but in order to get a restaurant, they have to be, as Douglas will confirm, certain amount of parking places per table, certain amount of parking places per employee, not to mention trash disposal and stuff like that. So we've got a very tight area down there. And so again, that, it's all gonna come back to real property and then council will make the final decision. Is that agreeable? Cool. Okay. All right. Um, Nicole, thank you, number one, for please uh, reminding me on this. After almost three hours, you get lost in that one sentence, discussion of marina input session, and that was critical that we talk about it tonight. And so thank you for reminding me that was in there. You're welcome. Okay, next meeting, um, 6 p.m. Tuesday, August the 25th, an executive session, if needed. In accordance with section 30-4-70A2, discussion of negotiations incident to proposed contractual arrangements related to the Marina Restaurant League. Um, council may or may, make it, take, may or may not take action. Do I hear a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. All in favor? <clears throat> Acclamation? Aye. Aye. Nicole, Aye. That, this hour? Sounds oh, like it was unanimous. Um, we'll log out of this meeting, log into our executive session link, and then come back. You're off right here at 853. All right. Keep in mind, you are still live streaming currently. Yeah. Jimmy? Jimmy, are you there? Jimmy, Jimmy who? <laughs> you. Um, Jimmy, Ron sent the other link to your email. Do you want yeah. me to send it to you again? I got it. Okay, so log out of this one, click leave at the bottom of your screen and then log into that other link. Oh. <laughs> you got it? All right, thank you, Ron.
the fun part. <laughs> you playing any of those guitars, Randy? Hey, not not lately, Kevin. But yeah, I still yeah. Hey, we're live, guys. Oh. Hey, haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> We got a quorum. <clears throat> Coming out of executive session, just for the record and for um, Nicole at 9.44 p.m. I would like to go ahead and make a motion. Is that Brian? Yeah, sorry, yes. I'm not sure who's all coming in, but I'd like to go ahead and make a motion that we um, go ahead and proceed with discussion as discussed in executive session with the Second. family group. Second. So, Second. Uh, motion by council member Buchanan to proceed as discussed and recommended by the, um, during executive session. And this was seconded by council member Ward. <clears throat> Correct? Sure. Correct. That'll work. Yeah, flip a coin. Oh. <laughs> um, I can correct it if, if I got it wrong. You're good. You're good. Okay. It's fine. Okay. Um, um, Council Member Smith just joined us. There was a motion to proceed as discussed. It was by board. And um, is there any discussion, or should I call a roll, uh, roll call? Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Council call. Member Moy. Aye. Council Member Bell. Aye. Council Member Streetman. Aye. Council Member Popson? Aye. Council Member Pound? Aye. Council Member Buchanan? Buchanan? Aye. Council Member Smith? Aye. Council Member Ward? Aye. Mayor Carroll? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> Motion to adjourn? Second. Second. All in favor? Unanimous. Aye. Aye. Well, have a good night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good job. Yeah. Good night.